A few summers back, my friend Gigi was going through a really dark time. We both lived in New Orleans, and the summer months are like an inverse parallel of winters somewhere up north. It's brutally hot instead of freezing. The town empties as people escape to cooler climates, and it seems endless. The summertime blues, it's like seasonal depression for southerners. It was the dog days of August, when even the breeze stops blowing. Sometimes the best way to beat the funk is just to get out of town. We planned a weekend trip to the beach in Pensacola, a four hour drive away with the intention of meeting up with a group of friends who were already camped out on a desolate strip of beach that we frequented back in those days. By the time we rattled out of the city limits in my oven of a car, Gigi was cheerier than I'd seen her in weeks. One overturned watermelon truck and two detours later, our four hour drive had turned to six and it was approaching midnight when we rolled into town. Either asleep or drunk, our friends couldn't be reached to get directions to where exactly they were on that beach. I doubt we tried very hard though. Neither of us care much for camping. What we did both care for quite a bit was a good old seedy motel. It was strangely hard to find one with vacancies Neither of us had a smartphone to look one up, and we searched the old fashioned way, finding a run down enough gas station and asking the clerk. That was how we found the rat trap. Weird thing. The guy at the desk didn't want to rent to me at first. He told me there were no open rooms, but recanted. Just as I was about to walk out the door and head over to the dirt ball across the street, we got our $40 room after all. Victory was fleeting. Some idiot had been creeping on Gigi in the parking lot while I was checking in. The stairs up to the second story landing were littered with the debris from the chain of a shattered door latch and the latch that had been on our door. I guess this was why the clerk didn't want to rent the room. The deadbolt was still intact though. We made sure to test it, registering the obvious implications of the strewn busted latch. There are seedy motels, and then there are seedy motels. And this one was really a cut above. I'm certain we wouldn't have stayed if the bolt lock hadn't been secure. But it was past 1am, and we were beat and poor, and it was our tropical beach vacation, balm for all that ails. We made wine spritzers with Topo Chico, played some cards, and put on the hallmark of motels across the nation, law and order, to fall asleep to. I figure the noises started at around two or three. I woke up to the distinct sound of long fingernails slowly drumming on glass. I slept on the side of the bed closest to the window and the door. It was close enough that I could reach out and touch the curtains lying down. I rose quietly and pulled the curtains open just enough to peek. Eyes. Just eyes. Wild, like when a horse gets spooked and shows his whites. She must have been trying to peer through the part of the curtain, because her face was inches from mine. Some horror movie stuff. I choked down a scream. We looked at each other for a minute. The fluorescent green light outside cast everything in a green pallor. It was like looking into an aquarium. Her acrylic nails were poised mid-tap, wig askew, eyes rolling, slightly swaying in her heels. I was so relieved I almost laughed. 
it was just a crackhead. I was impressed and pleasantly surprised by the authority of my voice, firm and angry, and not betraying my fear. She was asking for some guy. I can't remember the name. I guess it must have been the guy staying here before. Broken latch, crackhead ladies, everything checked out. I told her it was just me and my friend, and there was no dude. Don't ever do that with your nails on the window. It's creepy, I told her. Her voice was muffled by the glass. She insisted for a minute, like she thought he was there with us, but left pretty shortly, and I went back to bed. I don't know how much time passed, long enough that I managed to doze off. I jolted awake to the sound of the door rattling. Of course it was the same crackhead looking for the same guy as before, saying something to the effect of, I know he's there with you. But after some back and forth, she was gone again. The only thing was, I could swear I saw her open the door a crack. We checked the lock once more, just to be sure it couldn't open without a key. That I must have dreamt it. And once satisfied, we tried our best to resume our sweet slumber. Third time. I was certain that the door opening wasn't a dream. I could make out a silhouette of a woman with wild hair, backlit in the doorway. I flew to the door, slamming it shut with the force of all my body and Gigi right behind me, dragging the flimsy card table and chairs to create a barricade while I held the lock in place with both hands and the woman outside yelling incoherently the whole time. So, she had a key. All we could do was to shove every stick of furniture in the room against the door, save for the bulky armoire awkwardly blocking the room's closet. She seemed to have given up. We laid back down again, debating trying to make a run for the office to use the phone or ask for help somehow. But... Delirium and fear won out, and we nodded off, hoping she was satisfied at seeing that her boyfriend, or whatever he was, was not in our room. The next time the door opened though, there was a second voice, another woman. This time all hell broke loose. We were screaming, they were screaming, pounding on the door trying to force it open. The second woman kept yelling about needing to get in the room and that, we're not gonna hurt you boo boo, just let us in. And just let us in and we won't have to hurt you. When something finally clicked in my head, there was something in there they wanted, drugs, money, whatever. They weren't both pissed off at the thought of some dude cheating or sharing his drugs. Whatever they imagined he was doing to us in there with their adult brains. Just tell me what you want and I'll throw it outside. There was a momentary break in the din and I broke away, frantically looking in every place that I could think of for whatever had been stashed. Under the sink, the chamber of the toilet, air vents under the mattress, but I came up with nothing. It had been quiet for far too long. I pressed my ear up to the door listening. The second woman was on the phone, pacing in and out of earshot. When she came back to the door, she was laughing and reinvigorated, and they both went back to forcing the door. You wanna do this the hard way? I'm bringing my boys and they're gonna mess you up. We were matched dead even. There was no way we were going to be able to keep them out when the dudes they had called showed up. Dawn was just breaking. If they would just leave again for a minute, we could make a run for the car. But it seemed like we missed our chance. The second voice was still laughing like crazy, yelling about her boys with the guns coming to get us out of there. And then, silence. The door stopped moving. 
I heard footsteps on the stairs and then male voices. I pressed myself against the wall beside the door with my glass Topo Chico bottle raised. More voices. The woman talking in quiet voices that I couldn't make out. And then a knock. It was the police. They ran all of our information, let the women go and gave us 15 minutes to follow suit. Which was easy because we'd already packed, hoping to make a break for it earlier. Why we were told to leave is still beyond me. But it's not like we would have stayed anyway when the women could have showed back up at any time. Not to mention their friends with the hammers. I went down to the office trying to get a refund. Not happening. The guy told me I could take him to court, and I was steamed. He knew that other people had the key, or at least that the room was a trap spot for cracks. It's why he didn't want to rent it in the first place. In hindsight, I wish I had taken his ass to court. It just wasn't feasible considering I lived four hours away and didn't have the money for court fees or a lawyer. He probably knew that too. Greedy git. Back at the room, the police had left, and Gigi just wanted to get out of there. As I was grabbing my backpack, I looked at the awkwardly placed armoire, the only piece of furniture that hadn't been shoved against the door. The only spot I hadn't checked for whatever it was they were so desperately looking for. Then, we went to Waffle House. This happened about 30 years ago. I was the ripe age of 23 and ready to move out of my parents' house for the first time. My parents had been saving some money in order to give to me for when I wanted to move out, in order to put forward that money for a house. That, coupled with my grandmother's recent death, meant that I had accumulated quite a sum in order to try purchasing my first home. This was a while back when homes were cheaper, and it wasn't anything fancy. I knew I wouldn't be able to afford anything fancy, but I was happy with the idea that I would have my own space for the first time in my life. Whilst looking for places to live, did a friend tell me that he had an uncle that was selling a small rundown house with accompanying land at an extremely reasonable price. I jumped at the opportunity, had a look around, and even though it had clearly been neglected, and was most definitely a fixer-upper, I thought to myself that I could move in pretty quickly and do it up as I lived there. That was a mistake, but I didn't know that until now. The house was quite run down, as I said before, not all the windows would close all the way. Some of them were sort of stuck. The wood was peeling off. The locks didn't work. And the door was hanging on by its hinges. Those were also falling off. I knew it was a lot of work, and my parents were adamant that I should look elsewhere. But it being not too far from home, and still not far from the city, despite being a fair bit rural, meant that it was idyllic for what I wanted. The first two months were challenging. I ended up not moving out like I expected, leaving half my stuff there, and living back in my old room in my parents' house, which they weren't so thrilled about, as they wanted to sell and downsize, and they couldn't do that with me living there. But anyway, in the two months that I lived with them, I'd saved up enough money to start making some serious fixes in the house and give it some much needed tender love and care. Over the following weeks, did a guy called Barry come over? He was a general handyman that the guy who sold it to me knew and was helping me with the repairs at an also very reasonable rate. He and I seemed to be getting on quite well. For context, I am a female and an only child. Not that that's important, actually. And I thought that we had a good connection, despite him being at least 25 years older than me. 
but I saw him like a nice, protective, fatherly figure, in a sort of way. We got chatting one evening, when he finished doing some adjustments to the locks, and then he started coming on to me. I suppose I was being a bit generous with the beer, celebrating how much progress we had made. And just by the eyes he was giving me, I knew his intentions were a bit more than what I had in mind. I had to shut him down some way. So I just told him there and then that I had a boyfriend, kind of slipping it into the conversation. He went quiet when I made the pass by comment and kind of sat there a little bit bummed. I guess with him being a bit drunk, he was showing his emotions a fair bit more. Sitting there, gloomy, he stood up, wobbled, and said he needed to pee. Walked out the house, and didn't come back that night. We spoke over the phone the next day, and I think, judging by his chipper expression, he had forgotten what had transpired last night. I was hoping he'd forgotten that he'd made that pass in the confidence of being drunk, and hopefully, with me not offering any more alcohol, that situation should be avoided in future. During the next few weeks, he came round as scheduled, helped me out, and everything was as it was. I was happy. The house was coming along fantastically, and he was just making some adjustments to the attic, which was somewhere I still didn't really want to go. You see, there were still some boxes up there that belonged to the people who lived here before, and although this was now my house, I didn't feel super comfortable going through people's things, especially as from what I know, they were dead, and didn't have any relatives to hand this stuff over to. He was just changing the locks as they had fallen through, and the attic door was just swinging wildly in the ceiling. The story really begins now. Now that you have the background, of course, you'll understand why everything that took place did. So all the building works were finished, my house was looking good, and anything else that needed to be done, I was confident I could finish myself, or just didn't have enough money to put into yet. It was a typical summer's day, quite warm, and I had just finished work. I came home, had a shower, and sat myself on the sofa, ready to watch TV, and eat dinner on a little tray. As I was munching down my food, did I hear a noise above my head? It sounded like footfalls in the attic. Bear in mind at this point I'd only been in the attic about twice, and had vouched not to go there until it was absolutely necessary to clean it out, or to put things in. These noises were freaking me out, but I told myself that there were animals that had probably gotten in and tried to think of that. I kept on watching my show, but the noises persisted. Whatever it was that was up there didn't care that I could hear it, which made me more confident that it wasn't a person and that it must be an animal. The noises stopped not long after, but the next morning I woke up and one of the windows was slightly ajar. That was weird, I thought. I closed the window telling myself I must have opened it while I was tired in order to let the air in, and then closed it at night, but obviously not well enough. During the next few weeks, I kept feeling uncomfortable, that someone was watching me in the house. It was a very unpleasant experience. And after a few more days of this, did I have the courage to tell my dad that I was feeling uneasy and ask if he could come over and look around. He did, and didn't find anything suspicious. That's when he asked me about the attic. I told him that I hadn't been up there, and he said that he'd like to take a look just to check. He went up, had a look around, and then let out a yell. He found newspapers, chips, all kinds of junk food up there and was starting to get panicked. I came up, and that wasn't the worst of it. There were some Polaroid photos of me asleep, of me in the shower, 
all kinds of creepy pics. Someone had been up here. Someone had been taking pictures, letting themselves in and out of my house. I only just noticed that there were actually small holes that had been drilled from the ceiling down into some of the rooms so that you could look down these little peepholes and see into my life. I was beyond horrified. It turns out that the toilet had this little plastic ceiling ventilation that you could quite easily pull up if in the attic, given where the hole was. That's how whoever this was had gotten pictures of me in the shower, as I didn't have a curtain, I just had glass. I was so horrified. I took the pictures off my dad because we had to contact the police. After a lot of back and forth, they asked me who had access to the house, and I said no one, that I'd only just purchased it, and that I'd recently done a renovation. They asked if it were possible that someone who had helped me renovate may have a copy of the key, and that's when it hit me. I remember now that the handyman who'd been helping me out was the one who'd offered to put in all the new locks, and therefore, it could be possible he had a key. I was absolutely horrified at the thought. And when they went over to his house to question him, he confessed there and then. Not only that, it was pretty obvious because he had more Polaroids of me just sitting on his kitchen counter. Well, case closed, I'd say. I didn't want to press charges. I just filed a restraining order unfortunately, have not seen him again. I never felt safe in the house after that. I sold it after about another few months and moved three states away. I couldn't live anywhere near him, knowing that he was in the area. I managed a resort in the Adrianac for several years. The place is old and rustic. It's miles from civilization and very peaceful. It was built in the 20s and had somewhat of a sordid past. It was built for a Canadian senator who would run rum down from Canada during Prohibition. We still had the underground locked safe room where he would store the booze as well as hidden booze hiding areas underneath some of the cabins. Calvin Coolidge stayed at a camp across the pond during his presidency, and would visit my camp for the spirits, I'm sure. Anyway, I met a girl and decided to sleep out under the stars on the camp's peninsula. Well, it started to rain, so I suggested we sleep on the screened porch of the boathouse, which I thought was a pretty good compromise. So after we we're all set up, it was getting pretty late, about 1.30am or so. We were laying there, and I was all toss and turn because I'd been asleep and woken up. So I'm having a hard time falling asleep after stuff like that. We laid there for about a half hour or so before I heard the bathroom door open in the boathouse. It couldn't have been anything else but that door. I did all the maintenance on those old buildings, and oiling that particular door was on my work list for the next day. My first thought was my boss, the owner of the camp. She is notoriously nosy, and has been known to spy on the staff in their staff quarters. So she was my first logical thought as to who had made the noise. Why she would have been hiding out in the men's bathroom in the boathouse for over an hour is beyond my comprehension. I proceed to hear footsteps walking across the boathouse, down the three stairs onto the dance floor, and stopping right in front of the door to the screened porch. I lay there just waiting for the door to open, and my boss to call my name. And as the minutes stretched out, I started praying that she would open the door, walk away, sneeze, dance the funky chicken, or anything, but nothing. The rest of the night I stayed up, 
stiff and straight as a poker in my sleeping bag. No receding footsteps, no door noises, no nothing. My girlfriend, I, the night, and the empty boathouse. The next morning, my girlfriend, although she wasn't at the time, but she was the four years that followed, rolled over me and immediately asked me about the footsteps the night before. She had also stayed up all night waiting for some other sounds to explain those footsteps in the night and heard nothing. She was terrified and never went into the boathouse again. I unfortunately had to go into the boathouse on a daily basis. Everything was cool during the day. At night, I had to turn all the lights in the camp off. This is something I've done every night for the past three years. However, ever after, there was always a sense of dread going in there. Being alone in the dark in the boathouse. The worst part is there is an enormous hanging bed in the front of the fireplace. It was for the former camp owner to take naps on during the day, hung on chains so that the bed can be lifted out of the way for entering guests in the evening. Every single night, that bed was swinging. A 175 pound bed swinging on its chains in the dark of the boathouse. Until my last stay at the camp, if I went in at night, that bed was swinging. A few years back, one of my best friends and business partner was and still is a single dad. His ex-wife was in and out of mental institutions for years, and he had sole custody of his two kids, a boy of 10 and a girl of 14. My friend had to travel to New York in order to oversee the multimedia setup for the auto show for the Ford display. I was back at the office with the programmers during the day and would stay with the kids each evening. Their house was a new two-story rental in the woodlands of Texas. The development was built in a heavily wooded area just north of Houston. Weird stuff started to happen at night while I was there. I was watching TV with the kids when the lights would go off in the den. The light switch was on the other side of the room. I went over and the switch was turned off. I thought it was a problem with the breaker, or there was another set of light switches. But if there is another light switch, who turned it off? I flipped the switch on, and the lights returned. So we went back to sit down. The lights came off again. I walked back and found the switch flipped back down to off. This disturbed me, and went on for a while. I asked the kids if this had happened before, and they told me that every now and then the lights would go. So now I'm trying to act unconcerned in front of the kids. Suddenly, there was a loud crash in the attic. We went upstairs and opened the attic door to check. There was nothing there. It was completely empty, and thus no explanation of what had made the loud noise. I was thinking that there was someone else in the house. Their mother had showed up unexpectedly before at their old house, but she was in jail at the time, and supposedly did not know this address. Things quieted down, and it was eventually time to go to bed. I let the family Labrador check all the doors and made sure they were locked, then went up to the guest bedroom, which was between the kids' bedrooms. I left my door cracked, and I had just turned the bedside lamp off. And as I was lying down, I saw the silhouette of a boy crouched between the cable box and VCR lights on the other side of the room. I thought the sun was getting ready to try and scare me. So I turned on the bedside lamp and said, Gotcha. But there was no one there. Then there was another loud crash in the attic. This woke up the kids, and now they were scared. We then heard a door slam downstairs. I told them it was a new house thing, and that noises happen, and told them I would sleep in the day bed out in the hallway. I made my rounds again, and we all went back to sleep. 
When I woke up next morning, the kids and the dog were all asleep on the floor next to my bed, and I still had four more nights to go. I had to go to work that day, and when I got back to the house, it was getting dark. The wind was starting to pick up, and all of the tree limbs were swaying. There was thunder in the distance. However, the kids seemed fine. I helped them with their homework, made dinner. <laughs> nope, we weren't going to McDonald's again, and we were all finally ready to settle down and watch TV. The storm was worsening, and there was more thunder and lightning. The den in the house was huge, with large floor-to-ceiling windows, and the walls went all the way to the rafters. There was an interior balcony on the second floor that wrapped around three of these walls, and there was an exterior balcony facing the backyard. You could see through the upper windows out to the lower part of the outside balcony. So now the rain is coming down in sheets, the wind is blowing, and bursts of lightning. Suddenly, the daughter says she sees something moving out on the balcony. I look up and it looks like a pair of legs in dark pants scurrying past one of the windows. So I'm thinking, do I get the gun out of the master bedroom? But that opens up a whole new can of worms. So I run back up the stairs from the kitchen to the second floor hallway and out through the balcony door. The wind is blowing cold rain right into me and I get soaked but I don't see anyone there on the balcony. I go back downstairs and tell them that there's no one outside. Shortly thereafter, I tell them that it's time for bed and the son goes right to bed and goes to sleep. The daughter is afraid of storms and the dog won't go in her bedroom and her cat is nowhere to be found. I tell her I'll sit with her until she goes to sleep and I bring a chair into her bedroom and set it on the left side of her bed. We talk about storms, and I tell her about being in a tent in the army during really bad storms, and how nice it is to be in a house for this one. We both fall asleep. There's a loud clap of thunder, a flash of lightning, and I see a dark figure of about five feet tall standing in the far corner of her room. I jump to my feet, but now I don't see anything. I don't want to wake her up and carefully walk around her room to check the hallway and slowly sit back down. I eventually doze off again and later I hear a noise and started looking around. The cat is curled up on the foot of her bed and the dog is starting to lay down at my feet. The storm has passed and looking outside her bedroom window, stars are shining up above the tree line. I go lay down in the daybed out in the hallway, and just as I fall asleep, I hear the door downstairs slam shut. It sounds like the kitchen door to the garage. I go downstairs. The kitchen door, door to the garage, and front door are all shut and locked, and I start to walk over to the master bedroom suite, but something tells me not to go there. I head back upstairs and lay back down. What seems like seconds later, the alarm goes off, and it's time to start a new day. I have breakfast and go, and it was my turn to drive school carpool. I have always enjoyed the paranormal for entertainment, but kept with me a healthy dose of skepticism when it came to real life stories. Growing up, my mother was very much into the supernatural, or anything paranormal. Psychic, ghost, the afterlife, you name it. This instilled in me from a very young age a skeptical outlook on things of this nature. Instead, I would learn how psychic and paranormal experts fake evidence or cold read, and things of this nature to basically debunk my mum. Although I was always entertained by her stories on some level, she would always tell me my stories about my supposed gift to communicate with ghosts from a young age, and how my family members refused to babysit me because I creeped them out too much. 
I also have a lot of memories of being young and strange, unexplainable and downright creepy, with strange things happening to me all the time. But I would cope with it just justifying how there must be some logical explanation, such as sleepwalking, or that it's my overactive child's mind. There is one experience though, that has always stuck with me, which I witnessed as an adult. I wouldn't say it changed my mind, but there is something about this I cannot let go of or rationalize away. I even get emotional and start tearing up a little bit when I think about it today, which is very much unlike me. I am now 28 years old, but when I was 21, I worked in a four star hotel and spa named Erith Castle in Scotland located just outside of Stirling, where many of the bloody and violent wars that Scotland is historically known for took place. This is a real location, and already has a reputation for being haunted. Feel free to google it if you like. I want to tell you my experience of working at this hotel, and the strange events that I witnessed while working there. To give you context, the hotel is made up of two main buildings. The first is a new building, a typical hotel where the guests stay with luxury dining and spa. The other building is the castle itself, which is mainly only used for weddings and one time Sean Penn stayed with us while filming a movie, which was pretty cool. I worked as a kitchen porter, and my job was to wash dishes, clean up, and basically all the kitchen duties which didn't involve cooking, to allow the chef to focus on preparing the food. Whenever there was a wedding which needed to be catered for, some of us would be sent up to the castle to work there. Eventually, I refused to work in the castle. Of course, the staff then knew about the castle's reputation, and would tell each other stories about what they had heard. In my skeptical mind, I simply rationalized it as local entertainment and just got on with my work. One of the most frequent occurrences that would be reported is that whenever guests would stay in the castle, they would phone the front desk in the main building and tell us they could hear children playing and running around and ask if we could send someone up to deal with the children. There were never any children in the building. The castle was always reserved for the bride and groom to have the place to themselves, and I cannot stress how common this complaint was. Almost everyone who stayed in the castle reported the same story of being disturbed by the sounds of children playing in the hallway. Sometimes late at night, I could hear the sounds of running coming from the upstairs balcony in the central room of the castle. If I was ever brave enough to go investigate, it would stop. The basement floor of the castle has been turned into a few guest rooms and storage space for the staff to use. It looked like any other floor of a hotel, not the creepy basement of a castle you'd expect. There are reports that this floor is haunted by a groundskeeper. And also, I have a few stories about people telling me about a phantom dog that they could hear barking. I never encountered either of these spirits. But the reason I am mentioning the basement floor is because it terrified me specifically. Every time I was there, I felt the most uncomfortable feeling, like when people tell you they feel like someone is watching them. The entire floor gave me the most uneasy feeling ever. It would be like someone was breathing down my neck, or I was surrounded by something. I was never able to go down there without feeling stiff and having the most awful sensation of dread overcome me. It's hard to put into words, but I hated going down there. If you stand outside the castle facing it, there is a dining room just to the left of the entrance on the ground floor. In this room, there is an enormous painting of a woman, I forget who she was, a wife of the commander or something who lived there. This painting was also especially creepy. 
She has such a stern look on her face, which I guess was common from that era in style. Very regal looking. There were a lot of unexplained noises that came from the area this painting is located in, like knocks and bangings. One time, a group of us were standing in that room, commenting on how depressing the painted looked, only to be interrupted by a slow scratching noise that went all the way from the top to the bottom of the 10 foot high walls the painting was standing on. Odd castles like this do not have hollow walls, not like a loose piece of stone could have been falling inside or anything, which was my first thought. We could not figure out where that noise had come from. My most frightening moment inside that castle happened one night during a wedding. The chefs had finished with their job and had taken everything back down to the main building. I was left in the kitchen to finish, washing up and cleaning. The guests had left and the bride and groom were, well, it's not my business what they were up to. They were the only people in the castle and there were a few remaining waiters and staff there also in order to just help finish tidying up. I went out to the side door to the castle to have a cigarette. Let me take a second to describe the layout of the kitchen for you. The southwest corner of the kitchen was the entrance to the kitchen. The southeast corner was the washing up area where I was working. The northeast corner was a passageway to a small room where we kept plates, cutlery, and had a walk-in fridge. When I came back into the room, after finishing my cigarette, I could hear someone working in the back room, moving cutlery around, stacking plates, and the normal sounds of someone else working. So I paid it no mind and got back to washing the dishes. After a few minutes, I heard the working sounds from the other room stop and the room fell silent for a while. It sounded like nobody was moving, which I thought was strange. Another piece of information that you need to know is that me and one of the girls I worked with at the same time would play this game where we would try to creep up on each other and scare the other person. When the sounds of working stopped, there was an unusual silence. I figured, aha, that's the girl. She's about to try and jump scare me. My plan was to continue working like normal, and when she jumped out to try and scare me, I would be there as cool as a cucumber saying, nice try. I waited for a full minute, and she never jumped out. I waited for a second minute with still nothing, thinking she was just really committed to this joke. I went to investigate. I walked into this room and no one was there. I cannot describe how hard my heart jumped when I walked into the room to find no one there. I started questioning my own sanity and freaking out. I definitely heard someone working back there for a good 30 to 60 seconds before it stopped. The workstations the chefs used formed kind of an alley that you had to walk through to get out of the kitchen. No one could have left the kitchen without walking directly by me, washing dishes. And since I was on high alert, I definitely would have noticed someone leaving. The incident really freaked me out. I had to leave the building for a while and really didn't want to go back to finish my shift. Another time, I was working in the same kitchen and the night security guard had come through looking confused and told me to follow him. This security guard also had more than his fair share of creepy stories. While walking around this building at night, he took me through a room at the back, which had a small bar and was used to entertain the wedding guests sometimes. This room wasn't in use that night, and he asked me to tell him if I could smell anything. Upon stepping into the room, I was immediately hit with an overwhelming smell of cigar smoke. He insisted nobody had been using this room and the guests left a while ago. Apparently this room was previously used as the aforementioned commander's study, where he would draw up battle plans and spend time alone. Since I was normally working quite late, 
I knew this night's security guy pretty well. We talked about the creepy stuff we had both encountered in the castle, and he was insistent that it was not just stories. He began telling me of his stories and how common they occurred. After all, he was the guy who had to go checking the castle every time a guest complained about the children, and he told me his encounters were so frequent and unignorable. He had begun to do deep research into the history of the castle and its previous inhabitants. Apparently there were two children who had died in a fire, and they're the children of the woman in the painting in the dining room. Their nanny had run back into the building to try and save them, and was also killed by the fire. The night security guy told me he had personally taken a photograph of the castle, and in one of the upstairs rooms, slightly left of the entrance, you could clearly see him. Although shaken from other strange experiences, my rational skeptical mind was still there. He was a tall slim man in his 40s, spent a lot of time alone walking around the castle and investigating disturbances constantly. I figured he might have been exaggerating or making it up for a good story show, but the next day he brought in the photos to show me. In the upstairs window, just like he said, were the two children, and as well as their nanny, looking directly out of the window. It was clear as day. I don't know if that man still works there or not, but he owns a picture that will give you the creeps, and hasn't seemed to have put it online, as I looked. If anyone from Erith Castle reads this, or hears this, and a man matching that description still works there as a night security guard, tell him I'm looking for the picture, and send it to me. Once he showed me this photo, that was the last time I was ever in that castle. Every time a wedding has happened, I would refuse to cater for it. I'm not going. Someone else can. I was eventually fired from that job, because the manager would frequently fall out with me about this, but I honestly didn't care. I never wanted to go near that place again. Despite keeping my skepticism, I admit there was something about that place that just wasn't right. I will remember that job, and that castle, until the day I die. Just thinking about being back there, gives me the creeps. I am a 21 year old female from Europe. I live in a semi big town behind the local cemetery. Now I've always had experiences before with the paranormal since I was a child, like seeing apparitions at night, feeling presences and seeing spirits in my dreams. They didn't happen all the time, but enough for me to know that they were real. I also have a few friends that have a sixth sense, if you want to call it that, that have helped me through the years with these experiences. These experiences have become less as I got older, especially when I started university. But I can still feel presences when they appear near me, although I have never been able to see them or talk to them when awake. I did meet them through time to time in my dreams though. I didn't talk to them a lot, depending on what the dreams were about, or if I knew that I was dreaming. But I remember them being in those dreams because the feeling of their presence always lingered for a bit after I woke up. Over the past six months or so, I've been trying to pay more attention to my sixth sense, and try to train it as I always thought of it as an essential part of myself, but could never really bring myself to train it properly, because I was scared of seeing things like in horror games, or making a mistake, and accidentally getting the attention of a bad spirit. As far as I've known, my house has never been haunted. It isn't that old either, maybe 25 years, and we have been the only residents, but I start to get paranoid when it gets dark. My room is in the attic, while all the other bedrooms and whatnot are on the ground floor, and we don't have a basement. And when I walk through the corridor up the stairs at night, I always feel like I'm being watched. I also get the same feeling when I'm showering at night. I just don't trust the mirror or window. 
though it's high enough that people cannot look inside. I've occasionally seen figures in my peripheral view, but they never move and just disappear when I look at them directly. I also feel like something will run from behind me, if not looking, even if all the doors are closed, except my parents' room, which is always open, even when they're asleep. Though I've never felt something coming from their room. So I made it a habit to walk around with my phone's flashlight at night and occasionally look behind me. It became worse a few months ago when I had a nightmare of these shadow people. In the dreams, I was standing in the corridor and I knew something was wrong. When all of a sudden I hear people running down the stairs and lo and behold, the shadow people were running in broad daylight down the stairs through the corridor and exiting through the window of my old bedroom on the ground floor. There is one of them that stopped and looked at me in the eyes with just its white scribbly circles grinning at me with a smile that almost looked like that of a Cheshire cat before he also went into the room and disappeared when he goes through the window. And at that moment I realized that they had come from my bedroom where I was sleeping. I woke up in terror, turning all of my lights on and did the best to calm down before trying to go to sleep again. Another time, one of the Velux windows in the attic had mysteriously opened when nobody was home and all of the doors were locked. And even though I don't think it had anything to do with the paranormal, I did remember I have this big cupboard in my room that leads to a small area behind the wall that's big enough for two people to sit down. A few years back, that same window was open along with that cupboard door that is always closed. So I went to open it up to be sure nothing was hiding there. But as I was opening it up, I suddenly got the feeling a presence was there that I didn't recognize and that maybe wasn't so good natured. I couldn't open the door enough to peek in because my shoe rack was in the way. So I grabbed my phone to try and film if anything were there. The first few takes it didn't want to record properly, but in the end, there was nothing of interest and the video didn't capture anything either. My mum and stepdad know that I feel things, but we don't really talk about it a lot and I don't really have the need for it either. But my stepfather has said that he feels something weird in this house from time to time and it's only in certain places but he can't explain it either nothing majorly dangerous has ever happened i don't think i'm in danger but i wanted to know if any of you guys have experienced something similar and how you can get rid of shadow people I live in California, and when I was 18, I left the country for the first time. I graduated high school a couple of months early, with a 4.0 GPA, so my aunt and uncle took me on a trip to South America to celebrate. I was dating someone at the time, who isn't particularly important to this story, but it does come up later. Anyway. We went to five different countries and we were gone for a total of two months. My aunt and uncle were in their mid twenties and the legal drinking age in South America is 18. So when we weren't sightseeing and spending days on end traveling by bus, we were partying. We were staying in hostels and luckily they were all super nice and the other people staying there were also so lovely. We made a lot of friends from our stays and some of them we actually ran into again in other countries. For anyone who hasn't stayed in a hostel, they're mainly comprised of multiple rooms with bunk beds, shared bathrooms and a common room. So we get to Buenos Aires, Argentina and check into our hostel. Me, my aunt and my uncle were bunking in a room with this German couple who were very nice. One night, my aunt, uncle and I went out drinking, had fun, danced, listened to music, ate great food, the works. When we returned, the German couple were asleep in their bunk beds 
so we decided to go into the common area so that we wouldn't wake them. Our door opened into the common area, so it was pretty easy access to our room. We were sitting at the bar drinking, and I started talking to this guy. He was tall, a big dude, and had these long dreadlocks, and appeared to be in his 30s. Now I was just having a friendly conversation, but this guy, I suppose, took it as a little bit more than that, and he began asking me if I wanted to go on a walk, or if I wanted to go to the roof with him. Then he started touching my leg. I moved his hand and said, Sorry, I have a boyfriend. He laughed and said, A boyfriend? You need yourself a Peruvian. I laughed a little bit, and just responded, Oh, no, I'm okay with my boyfriend. He then said something along the lines of, Well, if your boyfriend really cared about you, he wouldn't have let you come to South America without him. At that point, I kind of just made it obvious, or at least I thought I did, how uncomfortable I was and decided to go to bed. I told my aunt and uncle I was going to the room and said goodnight. I was laying in bed for a few minutes when the door opened and someone walked in. I assumed it was my uncle and didn't turn around, when all of a sudden, my covers lifted and someone got into bed with me. I turned over, and it was the Peruvian. Usually in situations like this, my fight or flight is always on fight, but being drunk, five foot three, and with a guy being much bigger than me, I froze. He started smiling and pulled himself closer to me. I just started saying, no, no, no and hoping to wake up the German couple. I don't remember what he said to me. All that I remember is his heavy breathing and him touching me and trying to kiss me as I pushed him away. Finally, I told him, no, stop, get out, and I began kicking him. He got out of the bed, buckled and zipped his pants, and snuck out. I never even noticed that he had undone them. I sat there shaking in bed for a minute before I finally got out, cracked our room door open, and very quietly started calling for my aunt. She was laughing and talking to someone and told me to hold on, clearly not reading into the situation, but that's not her fault. My uncle saw me though and came into the room and asked what happened. I immediately burst into tears and told him before he stormed out of the room. The next thing I hear is a bunch of yelling in the common room before my aunt and the hostel manager fly into the room and turn the lights on. I was just standing there crying and my aunt hugged me. The manager asked me if I was okay and who it was, which guy. So I told him and he walked back out. In this, the German couple had woken up to all the noise and were very confused and they felt terrible that they didn't hear me begging this guy to stop. After a few minutes, all the yelling stopped, and it was silent. My uncle and the manager come back into the room and tell me the guy wasn't even a guest at the hostel. He had somehow made his way in past the front door. There was a lock and key to get in that only guests had. They kicked him out, and the manager profusely apologized to me. I guess when my uncle left the room, he started screaming and looking for the guy. When he found him, he was just standing there with a group of people laughing and drinking, like he didn't just sexually assault a teenager. I think my uncle got physical, and that's when everyone started yelling and the manager had to get involved. I don't think I slept at night after that. I get chills just writing about this. I know what happened wasn't okay but I'm lucky it didn't go further than it did. I hope that guy never did anything like that to another woman again, and I do hope to never meet him again. This story is very twisted. It also 
took place at a neighbor's house. The neighbor's nanny is a very kind-hearted old woman who has been babysitting and looking after the neighbor's kids and their large family for about 10 years now. She's a wonderful old lady who doesn't mean harm to anybody. She's also good friends with my mother. As in some days when my mother is sick or something, the neighbor's nanny will come over to babysit my younger brother. She told me this story one day when she had come over to look after him when my mother had gone out to the city to visit my grandparents as my grandmother was very ill and it was an emergency. She told me that strange things had been happening in the next door house. One night, the mother of the house woke up to someone banging from the backyard porch, almost as if someone was stomping. She was pretty scared and since her husband was out of the country that week, she, along with the nanny, went out to check what was going on. Now bear in mind, nanny used to sleep in on those days when the husband was out of town, and the mum and her little kids were alone at home. So basically, the nanny went out down the first steps and behind her followed the mum. And this is exactly what she told me. She walked down the steps towards the glass back door, and she pulled back the curtains to see a super old man with a white beard, all the way down to his elbows, standing there looking at her. He wore white clothes and had a plain dead expression plastered on his face. Trust me, every bit of it is true. She screamed, let go of the curtains, and the mother who was still tailing behind came rushing. But when they both pulled back, in order to check, to the nanny's utter shock, there was no one there. After this event, the mother made sure that she, the kids and the nanny, all slept in one room until the father came back from his business trip. Fast forward a few days later, the father had returned, the kids were at school, and my mother and the nanny were cleaning out a musty old closet in the attic. There were quite a few old boxes and dusty old bags being kept up there with stuff like old pictures, clothes or children's toys and souvenirs. Now, this closet that they were cleaning was high. So the mum used a stepladder in order to elevate herself so that she could easily look inside and take things out. Basically, the mother was up on the ladder cleaning out the closet and frequently tossing down dusty boxes and bags in order for the nanny to start looking at. Anyway, one by one, mum was throwing out dusty cardboard boxes full of old toys or clothes packed away long ago when she came across a small box. Surprisingly, it was packed up in fresh tape but smelled really bad. It seemed practically empty, as it was very light. Mum peeled away the tape and opened the box and peered inside. That is when she screamed in horror and threw it to the floor and began to cry. The nanny who was standing below watched as the box fell to the floor, entirely unaware of what was inside. She slowly stepped forward and took a look inside, and there was a doll, who she later found out used to belong to the mum, and it was very precious to her since a young age. The doll just lay there in the box, but on its plastic neck, someone had used a knife to make slashes and cuts. Now, since it was made of plastic, it was very obvious that someone had not tried to cut the doll's head but simply made deep slashes on its neck. The most shocking part was that the doll was packed away about 15 years ago in the box by the mum. She loved the doll and it held many childhood memories, but she didn't want to throw it away, so she packed it up. And literally no one had entered the attic for ages, as it was upstairs and only had old unimportant boxes. 
I don't know if the doll was linked to the old man, but it happened within that very week. So that remains a question unanswered. How did the doll get those slashes when it was safely tucked away and no one can touch it? And who on earth was that old man? To start off with, I'm a 19 year old female. And at the time of this story, I was around 15. I want to make it clear that I'm a very spiritual person and have had many encounters with the paranormal before, but this one was the most terrifying yet. Every year for work, my mother has a convention at a hotel that was built in the late 1700s. The place is massive and overall elegant. Since her work has been going there for years, our family gets a discount whenever we want to venture there for a vacation. This was my first time at the hotel, and I instantly loved it. With me was my father, brother, and of course, my mother. When we first got into our room, there was just a dreading feeling whenever I entered my room alone. So I tried to only go in there with my brother. We had a lot of fun eating gourmet food, getting a spa treatment, and wandering around the hotel grounds. I was outside one day with my camera and decided to take a picture of the main building. As I was looking through the camera, I noticed tiny windows at the top of the building. Nothing unusual, just windows to the old maid's quarters, my mum said. But I still got a weird feeling from just looking at them. And it didn't help that most of the windows were broken or even open in the dead of winter. One night after dinner, my mother and I decided to walk around the interior of the hotel while my brother and father rested in the room. It was around 8 p.m. and there were very few people, especially if you strayed away from the main entrance. We took our time walking around and looking at various rooms including a movie theater that we both refused to enter. Before we headed to bed, we decided to go to the very top floor to look out of some of the windows to get a better view of the town below. We entered the nearest elevator and pressed floor 16. As we were going up, my brother called to ask us where we were and my mum and him started chatting. All of a sudden, the elevator doors opened, and we were both frozen in place. The door opened, and we both got hit with an incredibly cold breeze, along with a pitch black room. We both immediately pressed a different floor, because we could sense that we weren't supposed to be there. I squeezed my eyes shut, because I was so scared something was going to pop out at me. Suddenly the doors close and we both start to relax. But all of a sudden, the numbers on the elevator display panel start going crazy. It was rapidly displaying two, then various other numbers, including those that weren't even listed as buttons on the elevator. I got so scared, and my mother and I were hanging onto each other in complete terror. By the time my mother was off the phone with my brother, we had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden, the panel displays floor 15, and the doors swing open. Not wanting to stay in the elevator, we decided to use the stairs. As we started making our way to the stairs, I start to feel a presence behind us. I let my mother know what I'm sensing, and she tells me just not to look back, and to walk as quickly as possible. That statement freaked me out even more, because my mother doesn't usually feel that kind of energy. As we're making our way down the stairs, I decide to look back, and what I saw will stick with me forever. I saw a tall, black, mist-like shadow figure a few feet behind us. It didn't have any features, and seemed to stand still. 
We kept running until we hit the main floor, and we could finally breathe. We decided to look at the elevator to see if the floor we selected had an employee-only sign, but it didn't. On our way back to our room, we figured out that we must have accidentally made our way up to the old maid's quarters, which sent a chill up my spine. My mum also came to the conclusion that the cold air must have just been the winter air making its way through the broken slash open windows. I agreed. But the cold air felt different from the crisp winter air from outside. But I could have just imagined that. When we got back to our room, my brother asked what happened, and we told him the whole story. All of a sudden, he looked at us with a weirded out look on his face, and he told us that while on the phone with my mum, when the elevator doors opened, he heard a bunch of whispers come through our end. This freaked me out so much, I opted to sleep in my mother's room the rest of the trip. Nothing else happened during our vacation, and we left a few days later. My mum still has her convention there every year, and now that I'm employed with her, I go as well. Whenever I go, I always experience things, but nothing that extreme. A month or so ago, I was watching exploring videos on YouTube of abandoned houses and the like. I had the urge to do so afterwards. So the next day I went to school, came home, packed my exploring bag, and went to an abandoned house in the countryside, which took about an hour to get to by bus. My friends were strictly suggesting that I don't, but I decided to do so anyway. My grandparents only lived a half hour from there. I was recording this. The house had multiple floors, a basement, first and second floor, and an attic. The casual house. It was pretty run down, and there was a lot of trash. I began by going into the basement. It was quite a creepy experience, and there were multiple dead animals, and a cross that was thrown on the ground. I was creeped out, my heart beating like hell, and I still managed to cope with it, and get to the first floor, which apparently had a living room and a kitchen. The kitchen's cabinets were full of mold, and the living room had a bashed TV, and there was some red liquid on the old couch. It had soaked it in. I didn't know what it was, so I can't assume. I was disgusted, and the smell was almost unbearable. After exploring the first floor, I went up to the second. It had a bedroom, a bathroom, and the bedroom had a bed which was collapsed, and the sheets were rotten, with a lot of holes, and again, another red liquid that had apparently soaked through. The smell in the bedroom was crazy, and I knew I needed to leave there as soon as possible. The bathroom had a broken mirror and a bathtub, which had human excrement at the bottom of it. Moving up to the attic, this is where I really had to get out of the house and make a run to the bus stop. The attic had bones, though I'm not sure what bones, possibly an animal's, it was too crazy for me, and I got out of there as quickly as I could. I got the bus, and went home to take a shower, and went under my blankets, and got cosy. Though the crazy part begins here, my phone had the recorded footage, right? No. When I checked it, the footage was corrupt, and the video was zero seconds, all black, and displayed an error that it couldn't be played. I, of course, was very disappointed, but continued on with schoolwork. I got home after school. The second day after going to the abandoned house, I checked my gallery. We had to draw something similar to what the teacher had drawn on the chalkboard, so I had snapped a picture. When doing my homework, I looked in the gallery, and there were the chalkboard pictures, 
but there was also a picture which featured some sort of distorted face. That was not a picture that I had taken. Since my phone is always with me, I know that none of my friends could have taken it and tried to be funny about it. The weirdest thing is that the picture was allegedly taken on the day I had explored the house. Though, when going home, there was only the corrupt video. I deleted the picture, thinking I probably accidentally downloaded it. However, I realized I was wrong. The pictures came every day, every single day, and they had the same date, the day I went to the house. I had also performed a factory wipe on my phone, had the system apps, but still, the image kept coming back. The examples of the picture are distorted faces, blurry pictures, and what I assume being a foot, and windows, and other stuff. When I tried uploading them to Discord, they can't be uploaded. It just says, error. The pictures have slowed down now, and they only appear on my gallery every four or five days or so. The weirdest part is that I've got a picture of a rock with something engraved on it. I am very, very scared. This happened to me over a year ago, at the end of March 2017, and I still can't be alone in my own home. Three years earlier, I had moved into a house that my grandparents left me before they passed away. I had spent some time renovating and was happy enough with it to move in. My grandparents had rented out the top floor to students and had made it into a small apartment. When I moved in, I decided to let my cousin who had some small personal problems move in upstairs, while my fiance and I used the two remaining floors for ourselves. We live in a small town, and like in all small towns, everyone basically knows everyone. And like most men in our town, my fiancé is a fisherman and goes away for long periods of time during the winter, sometimes from January to May. In our town, there are two brothers that are, well, I guess you can call them weird. Some may say original, though we all know they had struggles in the past. That probably is the reason behind their behaviour. But my path never crossed theirs, and I never talked to them, mostly because of the age difference. This particular night I was home alone. My fiancé was up north fishing, and my cousin was visiting family. I had come home late from work, and was just chilling with a glass of wine in front of the TV. I can't remember what was on. I usually just need to empty my head after work. So I was just sitting there in the dark, with nothing but the lights from the TV, lost in my own thoughts after a long evening shift. That's when I thought I heard some sounds outside. Usually when I hear sounds like that, I brush it off. I live in an old house, and old houses make sounds randomly and the rain was pouring down outside. Only once had it happened that it was actually someone out there, and that time it had been an Eastern European group of guys scouting out our house, since some groups like that like to travel around to small places and do burglary and petty crimes. I had this in mind, but I had not been home at that point. Only my fiancé and cousin, and they ran after them, and the men jumped into their car and were never seen again. I told myself the sound I had just heard was either the house or the rain, until I hear another sound again, more clearly this time, and this time it came from the deck on the side of the house that I sat. I froze as I heard steps moving closer to the window where I sat. 
The first window this person would come to, moving from that side of the house, would be my bedroom. He or she wouldn't see anything inside there. The curtains were down and the lights off. The steps kept moving towards the door that we had on that side of the house. And I knew once they got there, they would be able to stare directly at me through the door window. I quickly turned off the TV, so the room got dark. By doing this, I would for sure be telling them that I was home, unless they came from the forest behind the house, which means they had to climb and crawl a lot, and they would have seen that the TV was on from the front. To give you an idea of how my floor plan is, my house is built so that from the front you can see the kitchen through the two windows, and the living room through one. Moving around the house to the back, you have the window to the bathroom, bedroom, and door to the living room. And on one side, you have a couple of big windows into the living room, and on the opposite side, the entrance to the hall. And all around the ground floor we have a deck. So I sat still, heart beating fast. I could barely breathe while I was hearing the footsteps, now slowly coming closer to the door. The wood on the deck making sounds as the weight of the person pushed down on it. And that's when I saw the big shadow of a man outside the window, stopping and looking in. I stayed still in the chair, and I was sitting, hoping it was dark enough that he wouldn't see me. As he started moving again, I gasped for air. I could hear him walking into my outdoor furniture and stopping. He probably didn't see them in the dark. For a split second, I debated with myself if I should go and turn on the deck lights, but I didn't want to let him know I had seen him scared of what this person could do. I live in a small town, in one of the most baby-proofed countries in the world. These things were not supposed to happen here. Well, at least I had felt safe up until then. It could have been someone pranking me thinking they were hilarious, but I was not willing to take that chance. I grabbed my phone, and ran as quickly as I could to the kitchen and hid under the open counter area. I knew he wouldn't be able to spot me there from any windows if I sat still, and I quickly started dialing my dad's number, figuring it was either him or my brother who could come to help me fast. We share police with a neighboring town, and they are usually stationed here which means it would take them at least 35 minutes to get to me. Though it was late, my dad was quick to pick up, figuring I wouldn't call him that late if it wasn't important. I whispered quickly into the phone so fast, with such a low voice that my dad couldn't hear me, and I had to repeat myself. There's someone at the house. He just looked through the window. As I said it for the second time, I couldn't hold back my tears and I started sobbing. My dad told me to stay put, and that he would be on his way. He hung up, and I can remember how I had wished he wouldn't have done that. I would have felt safer had he have stayed on the line, but I would find out soon enough why he had hung up. I tried to call my fiance, straight to voicemail, and again, straight to voicemail. I stared at my phone, hoping someone would call, trying to keep out the sound of the footsteps that I could hear coming closer to the kitchen. Then, absolute silence. I held my breath, listening, but I can only hear my own heartbeat. Had he jumped off the deck to the side where it was closest to the ground? I waited before I crawled out, and fully peeked out of the kitchen windows. I spotted him walking slowly away from the house, down my driveway, then he stopped and turned around, looking towards the window where I was sitting. Was he smiling? I couldn't tell because it was so dark, 
and the street lights weren't enough for me to see him clearly, but I could have sworn he was smiling at me. At the same time, my driveway got lit up with lights from a car, and I could see who he was before he ran into the neighbor's driveway and disappeared behind some bushes. I jumped when I realized whose car it was. It was my dad's business partner, John. I ran out towards him. My dad had called him and asked him to go to my house because he was closer. I had never been happier to see him. I quickly told him who I had seen and he assured me that my dad was only minutes away before he jumped into his car to pursue the man. The man I had seen had been one of these brothers that we all find weird. The one known to be a schizophrenic drug addict. But why had he been outside my house? He was not known to burgle people's homes. My dad came and called the police, who came and took my statement. John came back and said he had not been able to spot him and that he probably ran into the forest on the other side of my neighbor's house. The police couldn't arrest the guy since he hadn't done anything. Scaring the living shit out of me was not a big enough crime, but they knew who he was and promised to talk to him and tell him to stop scaring people. As for me, they told me to call if he ever did it again. I didn't stick around to see if he came back that night. I packed some things and stayed over at my parents' house until my cousin returned two days later. Sadly, this was just the beginning of something that would last for almost four months. A week or so had passed since the guy had lurked outside my house. I was busy working and didn't have much time for anything else though I had the episode fresh in my mind every time I went to bed. That Friday after work, I was going to have some friends over for food and game night, so I stopped by a store to get some groceries. As I stepped out of my car, I could see someone from the corner of my eye, mostly because this person had bright red and pink clothes on. As I turned to walk in, I saw him. He was on a bench and looked at me with a smirk on his face. The chills I got were indescribable. I walked as fast as I could into the store and grabbed the things I needed before I hurried back to my car. I couldn't see him anymore until I left the parking lot. He was standing with his bike behind a building peeking around the corner. As I passed him, our eyes met for a split second before I stepped on the gas to get away. That same night after my guests had left, I went to bed and was laying in my bed checking my Facebook, Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram. The whole routine before going to sleep. I heard my cousin unlocking the front door before locking it, and heard him walk upstairs to his apartment. At least I knew he was home, and I could finally go to sleep. I must have been half asleep slash half awake when I heard someone knocking on the windows in my living room. My heart was beating so fast in my chest that I froze, and it quickly went from knocking to pounding. I was sure this person would break in the window soon enough, and of course the first thought that hit me was that it was the same guy, and he was back. Had he seen me at the store, and he was back to terrorize me? Then the knocking moved to my bedroom window. While knocking, he started shouting, Open up. I know you're home. I was so scared, I couldn't even describe how afraid I was. He repeated the sentence while slamming his hands against the window. I'm not religious, but at that moment I was praying to all kinds of gods. I slowly picked up my phone about to call my cousin, when my cousin texted me. Just pretend that you're not there, and he'll go away. That's when I understood that the guy that was out there was there for my cousin, 
which meant that my cousin would have met them at the local bar or wherever he had been. I wrote back a short F you to my cousin. The guy outside my window, however, just kept going. He knocked on all my windows and rang my doorbell for 10 to 15 minutes before it got quiet. I went out to the kitchen in time to see him leave, and when he was under the streetlight, I could see it had been the brother of the first guy. The day after, my cousin told me he had met him at a party, and they had argued and had followed him home. I do believe that my cousin was lying though. My cousin has an on and off relationship with drugs, and this was within a period that he was on. My guess is that he had gotten some drugs from the guy, and he didn't want to pay for the whole amount. What happened the day after makes me even more sure about this, because the same afternoon he was back, he rang the doorbell, I opened it, and it was after I opened that I knew who it was, or else I probably wouldn't have opened it in the first place. He asked for my cousin. He said my cousin owed him something, and I told him my cousin lives upstairs and that he had his own doorbell. I also knew my cousin had just left. That's why I told him. Before he left, I got tougher than that. Tougher than I'd ever been before or since. I took a deep breath and let him know it wasn't nice to knock on people's windows during the night and that he scared me. He actually said he was sorry and that he wouldn't do it again. Fast forward two weeks. I was out on my daily run with music in my ears and not really thinking about much or not really paying attention to anything but the road in front of me when I had to stop to tie my shoelaces. As I got up, I could see this guy from the first night standing at the top of a hill with his bike and he was looking at me. I got back up and started running again, but this time I looked over my shoulder and to my surprise, he was already getting closer to me. I took a route where I knew there would be more people, but it was a bit longer. And after changing directions, I looked over my shoulder again and he was closer still. I begged that I would see someone I knew so that I could stop and talk to them and let him pass. But when he was right behind me, I had still not seen a soul. Fortunately, I saw a man out walking his dog and stopped straight in front of him. I said I thought his dog was cute and he let me pet it. And the guy passed us on his bike. But I could see that he kept looking at me over his shoulder. All while he had that crazy smirk on his face. The man with the dog asked if I was okay. I didn't want to sound paranoid, so I just said yes. I couldn't see the stalker or his bike anywhere, but I still decided to run back and take my original planned route. I was almost home when I spotted him at a bus stop, leaning over his bike, looking down at what probably was his phone. I crossed the street and looked over my shoulder to see if he saw me. I thought he had, but I think I made it unnoticed. Still, I locked the door behind me as soon as I was inside, but when I was in the kitchen getting something to drink, I could see him on his bike slowly moving as he passed my driveway, looking into my house before disappearing behind some trees. I went to take a shower after that. I just needed to relax and wanted to surf the web for a little bit. When I went to check my Facebook, I could see I had a new friend request. Guess who it was? Him. I have no idea how he found my name or my Facebook. But as I said before, I live in a small town, so it wouldn't have taken him a long time to find out who I was. He might have even read it on my mailbox. I did not add him as a friend though. A few days later, while I was at work, I got a message on my messenger. It said that someone had asked to send me a message. Of course, it was him again. Declined. He tried to get in contact with me over messenger for about a week, until I blocked him. After this, I came home one day to a note on my door. All that it said 
was Admi on Facebook. And his first name and made up last name. I think it was Bond or something like that. I saved the note and later handed it over to the police when the stalking got too much. His brother never came back to the house. But one time the both of them were walking behind me when I was out walking with some friends. They were just staring at us. His brother also once asked me why I didn't want to add them on Facebook and why I didn't talk to his brother. I never replied to any of them. I finally got my cousin to tell them to chill on the stalking. And this is when it went from bad to worse. With daily visits from at least one of them, but mostly the first guy. I think the brother might have showed up to where I was about three times. The first visitor started hanging around outside my office, my gym, my house, and anywhere I was really. It got super intense. Of course, I started telling people more about this, and all of them told me to contact the cops, which I did. I gave them all the notes and messenger messages, and told them about the stalking, and said I had witnesses. They promised me that they would keep an eye on him, and told me that it was not the first time he was doing these things. That didn't calm me down at all. Why couldn't they just get him some help? So this stalking that he did went on for another month, and it seemed like he just enjoyed the attention the police gave him, because the day they told him to stop, he just came back in for an extra time. Finally, my fiancé returned home from work, and the two of us were out at a restaurant eating one night. I had of course told him all about it, and as we were about to leave, we saw the guy staring at us, standing outside the restaurant. My fiancé went straight out to the door and over to him. I didn't hear everything that was said, but I heard my fiancé telling the guy that he would put his boot up to where the sun doesn't shine if he ever saw him around me again. After that, the guy only stalked me about three times. My fiancé is a strong dude, but I don't know if it was that or the guy just gave up. I just hoped it would stay that way, even after my fiancé left for work. Fortunately, it did. I haven't seen them since, and I still would rather never meet them again. This happened about a week and a half before Easter. For some background, I am a 29-year-old female, about 5 foot 1, and 120 pounds. However, most people mistake me for a 15 to 16 year old girl. The youngest I have ever been mistaken for was about 9 to 10, but that was by my nanny's best friend who hadn't seen me in years and just assumed that I was one of her great grandchildren. It was actually quite funny and we had a good laugh. Anyway, on to the weird encounter. My mum needed to go to Walmart to pick up a few things that my dad had asked her to get, and some stuff they both needed in preparation for their upcoming trip to go to West Virginia four-wheeler riding on the Hatfield and McCoy trails they have up there. My mum, dad, one of my sisters, her husband, and my four nephews and nieces were going for Easter weekend. This would be my mum's first time going, and she wasn't really happy that they planned the trip on Easter weekend, but they assured her they would be back early Sunday, so we could still celebrate and have Easter dinner with my other two sisters and other four nephew and nieces. When we got there, my mum got a basket and headed off to the hair care and pharmacy section. I told her that I was going to look in the bedding department to see if they still had any fleece blankets left over that they had on sale, as I used them for my guinea pigs. So she said that if I got done before her, she would still be around that area and to look for her there. I managed to find a few blankets, left and got them and headed over to find my mum to stick them in the basket. 
She was right where she was, in the same section, and it seemed like she would be there forever. Across the way was where they had all of the Easter candy and decorations, so I told her I was going to go see if they had any of those pooping animal themed candy dispensers. I loved those things. My sister gave me one years ago, as a sort of joke for Easter, and coincidentally, I loved it. So she's always given me one every year since, whether it be for Easter, Christmas, or whichever other holiday. I have quite the collection, and do love receiving them. It's a long standing and fun tradition between my sister and myself. When I get over to the Easter section, there is no one there but me, and I'm relieved, because most of the people this time of year flock there in the seasonal sections like moth to a flame, and refuse to move from their spot, and won't let anyone else get a look. So I'm browsing through and checking out the candy, when this guy comes around the corner into the aisle I'm in. He's a nice looking young guy, and looks to be around 19 to 20. At first, all seems well. I'm going on looking at all the stuff when I get this feeling, as if he's staring at me. So I move down the aisle pretending to look at the stuff, while trying to gauge if he is actually staring at me or not. I thought to myself, okay, he's just a young guy, and probably thinks I'm a young girl around his age, and maybe checking me out. After another minute or two of this, it becomes clear he isn't looking at anything in the aisle but me, and every time I glance, he averts his gaze very quickly, and pretends to be checking out a product. At this point, it just becomes too weird for me. If he would have said something, I think perhaps I would have felt more comfortable, but he just kept staring holes right through me, and it began to make me feel uneasy. While he was pretending to look at the product on the shelf, and trying to look intently interested in it, I seized the chance to quickly move around to the aisle on the other side. He didn't see which way I went, and when I was in the other aisle alone for a bit, I felt that maybe I was just being too paranoid. And that's when I see him standing right next to me. I never heard him or saw him enter, and boom, he's right there all up in my space. I'm kind of startled by this, and then my creep meter goes up, and I start to get the heebie-jeebies, and this feeling that something isn't right with this dude. So I move on down the aisle, trying not to show any fear, and a couple of seconds in, he's moving right along with me. So I quickly turn around as if I'm looking at something on the shelves behind me, and he does the same. About that time, thank God, some woman comes down the aisle with her buggy and distracts him. More like, startles him. So I move to a different aisle. I'm there for a bit before he finds me again, and he slowly starts inching his way closer and closer to me. He's wearing a hooded sweatshirt, and as he gets closer he starts putting his hands under his shirt. It sounds like he's fiddling with his belt buckle, all the while stealing glances of me. At this time I'm panicking inside and trying to move away from him, but he follows me everywhere. I look him straight in the face, and he is just staring blankly at me, all the while still doing whatever it is he's doing under his shirt. About that time, both the women from the other aisle and my mum come in, and I am so relieved. My mum tells me that she's going to the food department, and I say that I'll go with her. At that point, I wasn't about to go anywhere by myself in that store without weirdo on my heels. As we leave, he is acting all normal, as if he wasn't doing anything creepy, and picks up a bag of random candy and walks out to the other end of the aisle. Finally, I feel relieved, and that I'm in the clear. So on the way to the food section, I remembered I needed to stop by the pet department, 
and get my dog Otis a bag of his favourite treats. So my mum continues on to the drink aisle, and as I pick up a bag of dog biscuits, I look to my left, and to my horror, the guy is there again. I'm thinking to myself, what the hell? Has he been following me this whole time? And now he's got me here alone, again. At this point, I'm really wishing we had come to Walmart when it was rush hour and the place was packed like sardines. At least I wouldn't find myself so isolated and alone in the aisles with this creepy dude. I get my dog treats and walk as fast as I can out of the aisle and head quickly to the drink section where my mum said she would be. Thank God she is there. I stick my treats in the basket and decide that I'm not going anywhere else alone in this store. Throughout the whole entire time we were there, he was in every single aisle we went in, just staring me down and looking for any opportunity when he might find me by myself again. But I never gave him the chance. We got our stuff and went to check out. He tried the checkout two lanes away, in hopes of following us, I suppose. But the little old lady in front of him picked up something that didn't have a price tag, and she held up the line. He couldn't go anywhere else, and by that time we were finished checking out, and got the hell out of there. As we were loading the car with stuff, I saw him come out of the front door and just stand on the sidewalk, scanning to see where I'd gone. But he never saw me, because I hid on the other side of the car, and he gave up. I told my mum all about it on the way home, and she agreed with me, that he was acting stalkerly and in a stalker-like manner, and that he very well must have thought that I was about a 15 or 16 year old girl, all alone. We know what his intentions were if I had been that age and alone. He may very well have followed me out and tried to abduct me. But who knows, and I hope no one ever has to find out. I have a pretty weirdly set up house. To the right of our house, we have no neighbours, and a very big open empty field that stops at a busy road, and across the road is a park. My mum and I live there, and our house is pretty small, but just the right size for us. The kitchen door is less of a door and more of an open living room and dining room connected. Super creepy unfinished basement with an unlocked attic door above the stairs. My room has always felt safe. My mum's room, however, always feels cold and uninviting. When I say home alone, only when I'm there alone, weird things do happen although my best friend has said that she has felt some things in my house, like heard noises, felt eerie presences, and cold spots, as well as being watched and touched. I have never been physically interacted with, but every time I go down the stairs, I get an intense and overwhelming feeling of dread, and like I'm being watched. I usually end up feeling that way right as I pass the attic door, which is important for this story. So about six months back, I started hearing what sounded like rodents in the attic, which very well could be the case, except I also heard the distinct sound of small shoes. So unless the rodents were taking tap lessons, something was up. One day, I'm home alone. It's around 10 p.m. and I started hearing a rolling sound from the corner of my room. The ceiling, the attic floor, it was the sound of a ball being rolled hard enough to bounce off the wall and go back to wherever was rolling it. Well, I wanted to be sure I wasn't going crazy and went to the ceiling and knocked on it. I was shaking because my house had never really felt safe, but I was never convinced that there were ghosts. Whatever was up there responded with the same number of knocks I used 
at the same speed. To say I almost pissed myself is an understatement. One time prior to that, when my best friend was over, she said she saw a shadow in my closet. I have a small shelf above my closet rod, and she says that she saw the shadow of a small boy there. Just last night is the most recent eerie situation. I was waiting for my best friend to come get me after work. I was in my room which had two windows, one to the big field and one to the unfenced backyard. The basement stairs are right behind my head and the back door is right in front of the top stair. So I'm in silence finding a YouTube video to watch on my TV. When I hear clear humming from a female voice, of course, I held my breath and listened. I then heard what sounded like someone pushing against the back door. I ran to my window and looked out. Nothing. It wasn't coming from inside, and a bit later the same thing happened at the front door. Still nothing. Am I being haunted? Is my house just old? Or am I going insane? I live in rural South Texas. It's pretty isolated, and the nearest Walmart slash big city is about an hour's drive. The drive itself is pretty safe, and there are always people from town on the road. Fast forward. My sister is in town for the weekend from college, and my mum and sister and I are at Walmart pretty late. It was around midnight because we'd been to the movies and shopping. It was a girls' night out. This wasn't unusual behaviour on our part, because it usually is pretty safe and we're all together. My sister and I got distracted and left my mum to go to look at random stuff while she got veggies. This is when I first noticed him. Down the aisle where my sister and I are goofing off is a man in a jean jacket, cowboy hat, matching belt to his boots and heavily curled and gelled long hair and sunglasses. Keep in mind it's pretty hot in South Texas and nighttime, and this was before wearing sunglasses inside was a thing. So in my head, alarm bells are going off. Something about this guy is really getting to us. My brain though is trying to convince me that it's normal for people to stare at us, as sometimes people do when they ask if we're twins and I put down what I had in my hand and told my sister, who hadn't seen the guy, that we should go back to our mum. We go back to her, and don't tell her anything, as we thought the man was just a one-off. Nope. He showed up at the fruits too, close enough to watch, but not too close to invade our space. At this point, I tell my mum to watch that guy, and tell her that we were at the other aisle too. She brushes it off, and we keep our grocery shopping, but eventually she got quite afraid. The man followed us around the entire superstore for a good two hours, and even got to the checkout line a few people behind us. We were pretty scared, given that we were completely unprotected, and our car wasn't parked anywhere near the entrance. So we found a night shift security guard before going to our car, told him what was going on, and he kept us company while we unloaded groceries. I heard him radio in the other security guards, but didn't bother to ask what happened. We just hightailed it home. I've grown up in different haunted homes. When I was 10, we moved to a house that was built in 1902. Two stories, and out of the town, an old farmland. Upstairs, there were three bedrooms and a large common area. My bedroom didn't have a door for whatever reason, and was in between the other two. I was laying down in bed facing the door without my glasses on, which, even though I had an awful prescription, I managed to see a girl walk by in what I thought was a nightgown, and called out my sister's name as I thought it was her. The girl didn't even acknowledge me, and just kept on going. When I realised she hadn't acknowledged me, I immediately rolled over to face the wall. 
The next time something happened was when my twin brother and I were home alone. We were downstairs in the living room, which was directly under the common area upstairs, and we heard heavy pacing back and forth for multiple minutes. We ran and hid, as any scared 11 year old would, and we told our parents about it, and our dad had also seen things. He'd seen an old man around the house, and then another person outside on the property. We then moved to another home. This one was built in the 50s. It had an attic that was only accessible through a bedroom that had stairs in it. That was my brother's bedroom. My bedroom was the one next to the staircase on the other side. I was in bed and heard the staircase creaking, as if someone was walking up it. I yelled out for my brother to stop because he was keeping me up, and my mum came in and told me that he was in the living room with her. Everyone else was asleep in that house. I never saw actual figures, just dark spots that would move. Then due to my dad's job, we had to move an hour away. The house was weird. I had to share a walk-in closet with my parents and I hated that. It freaked me out. My stomach would start churning when I looked at it, and when I had to go in it. It was ten times worse. I brought it up with my dad, and he told me he could actually see the spirit in the closet, and it wasn't nice. I was nearly 13. It was the winter of 2012. Insecure, unsure, and sad. A lot of things were going on in my life that I couldn't really think clearly. I didn't know who I was, where I was going with life, or if I'd get far enough that I'd need to worry about it all. I struggled a lot with depression, anxiety, and I went through something a kid should never have to deal with. It definitely wasn't my proudest moment. Firstly, at 13, I logged onto a recently created Facebook and email in search of a friend. Boy, girl, young, old, I was lonely, it didn't matter. I was the strangest person at school, but that all changed when I met a girl named Olivia. She seemed nice enough, very smart and very caring, pretty too. We talked every day, like seriously every day. From the moment I woke up to the moment I passed out at night, she would call me after school, before bed, and even overnight. It was like she was Pavlov and I was a dog. If I were ever sad, she would cheer me up, and would send me cute animal pictures and lovely sayings. She managed to be my source of happiness, strength, and ultimate confidant. I thought of her as my best friend, while she thought of me as much more. She liked to send me pictures of her face, pasted onto pictures of me and my friends. She started to spread rumors about me being gay, to my family, friends, and elders. People she didn't know. People I respected around this point, and she started to print out my photos from Facebook, Instagram, and even Snapchat. All secretly, and behind my back. I had no idea. I thought she was my closest friend. I could open up to her about things I never thought I could tell. But her sweet voice was like the lull of the siren. It was like I needed her. Her presence was a treat, and I was figuratively an unsuspecting dog with my heart and mind being held captive, all for being taught to need that treat. Fast forward about a year. At this point she had made multiple Facebooks, Snapchats, and other social media for multiple characters she was about to use against me. At 14, I had been trying to avoid this girl who used to be a huge part of my life. She still managed to Snapchat and Skype call me at least twice a day. What little friends I had left had finally had enough of her incessant calling and texting, and Olivia wouldn't stop until I was completely alone. She lied to two people I tried to have a long distance relationship with, which meant having an online based relationship, just like with Olivia. Both boys had been my friends a couple of months first. They were nice, cute, and caring. 
I didn't think I needed to ask my best friend for permission to date. Each relationship was at least six months apart, but they felt like lifetimes. I managed to get attached to them. I'm very faint at heart. And Olivia managed to use her specially crafted fake accounts to weasel her way into said relationships. She found their Facebook accounts and told them that I was her girlfriend and that I was cheating on her. She let them know how hurt she was. Olivia said she just couldn't be alone. She told them how easy she could swing their direction. She made proof of her own, as Olivia managed to convince both boys that I was evil, that I was a liar and a cheat and could not be trusted. And that was when she started to be involved with them. Olivia was conniving and used her tricks on them. They wanted her, and I lost everyone. I was alone and vulnerable. She knew just how to calm and soothe me. She kept telling me she loved me and that everything would be okay if I just trusted her. Olivia made me believe that I didn't need anyone but her. Regardless of what you think, she terrified me for so long. She would block me, then unblock me, would constantly send me snapchats of her hurting herself or her crying. Sometimes she would call me to tell me every flaw I had. We had good days and bad days. On the bad days, she would tell me her life was better. On the good days, she was the best friend I ever had. And I let her, but that's not all that happened. She learned my weakness. She listened to when I vented and would use it all against me. I eventually believed that I was no one. Every bad thing that happened to me was my fault. And I had to get used to seeing more of my four bedroom walls and my phone than I would of any past friend or family. My life sunk so low that my grades were slipping. I was failing because I was just so depressed. If I didn't have Olivia, I just couldn't manage. I hated her so much for what she was doing to me. But why did I still love her? Why did I feel like she was the only one who got me? Quite a few months after I turned 14, she called my school. She told them I was a risk to myself and that I needed help. I had been hurting myself and was afraid. Consequently, she nearly got me sent away. Although Olivia spared no time to message me right after, that apparently her two-year-old nephew Theo died of cancer. She said that's why she called. Olivia sent me a picture of a cute little dark-haired boy who was sitting on a slide smiling. She just needed me at that moment. Regardless of if I hated her or not, she couldn't be alone. After this, she would often Skype me just to talk about ending it all, but I didn't know who to call. So I clicked off my iPad and went to bed. I couldn't take it anymore. She drained me with needing constant attention. She constantly made me feel paranoid, anxious, afraid and isolated. She loved me, I thought, my best friend, and wouldn't hurt me on purpose. But I woke up, the hundreds of messages, calls, missed video chats, emails, Facebook messages and the like. Even pictures of her harming herself, pictures of admittance in a hospital for nearly taking her life. And it was my fault. At that point I was spiralling. I was alone. She infiltrated my life and exiled me from my friends and family. My life was over. I blocked her. I blocked everyone that could be her. And I deleted everything which eventually became my Achilles heel. As I could never receive help because of my mistakes. Coupled with that, I cut myself off any type of device that could have internet. I also started to self-harm. I felt like it was the only way I could control my pain. It was the only thing I could control. And I was dying inside. Explicitly, I had hit rock bottom. It was 2015 and I was close to turning 15. It had been almost three years since this all began. And I hadn't heard anything from Olivia since the hospital situation earlier in the year. I was recovering from a suicide attempt that no one had ever found out about. At least, I was trying to recover. I was completely alone. 
and one day I recover a Snapchat message from an unfamiliar person, asking questions that only sounded like someone in particular. It couldn't be. My stomach twisted, and I couldn't believe it. What's up? It said, so nonchalant. I replied with something similar to, Who is this? The little dots kept popping up. Whoever this was had a lot to say. Apparently it was Olivia. She was feeling lonely. Her adoptive family had been cutting her off, just around the time her little brother's birthday. I asked for a picture. I didn't know she had a brother. She told me she was an only child. Whenever I checked Olivia's chat, after a few hours since I couldn't have my phone at school, what I saw sent chills down my body. The image of her little brother was the same picture of her nephew Theo that died of cancer. I didn't question her, I just said goodbye, and I deleted that Snapchat account. I also deleted my email account and stayed offline for a while. Four years later, 2019, I haven't had any contact with her. I constantly search for her name to ensure she stays blocked, and I block anything suspicious. I'm now engaged to be married, and very happy. I haven't needed therapy in years. I hope my story doesn't rouse the devil. So, both my fiancé and I work at Walmart. We live in a smaller town in Colorado. And right now, there's a stage two fire ban due to all the fiery shit going on. Meaning you can't even smoke a cigarette outside without potentially getting a $1,000 fine. Also worth mentioning that because we live in such a small town, the cops slash fire department don't have much else to do than patrol parking lots for public cigarette smoking. We both smoke cigarettes, and both of our cars have different issues right now, so we've been sharing one. We can only smoke in our cars on our brakes for now, and since he was working and I wasn't, I visited him on his break so we could spend a few minutes and a cigarette together. I pulled up to the front of Walmart, and thinking he would only take a minute to get to me, put on my emergency lights and waited. After a couple of minutes, a car drives past me, but slows down and rolls down his window, without saying anything. The guy in the car didn't stop, call out, or even stare at me for very long before parking, but something still creeped me out a little. I called my fiancé and told him to try and hustle a little more, mentioning the guy that was weirding me out. I understand if I had my emergency lights on, but I mean, people do this outside of Walmart for brief amounts of time all day, and who conveniently breaks down in front of a Walmart anyway? While still on the phone with my fiancé, whom I can see walking towards my car from the second entrance at this point, I noticed the guy get out of his car and walk into Walmart through my rear window. But instead of continuing in, he cuts immediately towards the side door I was parked by. He comes out the side door, and I see him holding what looks like a baseball bat. So I'm freaked out at this point because the guy starts walking towards my car at the same time, and my fiancé is also walking up. The creepy guy gets to the right corner of my hood, standing there with what I can now see as a two to three foot long sword with a sheath over it looking past my car like he's looking for someone, or pretending to look for someone. This guy also has an assortment of knives that slide into a belt around his waist. I managed only a few glances at his face without trying to be noticed, but I could definitely tell that this guy was on drugs. Hard to tell which, but I would guess meth based on his eyes and paranoid actions. My fiancé finally approaches the passenger door when Meth Man turns to him, and I'm ready to lay on the horns or something as a distraction. But Meth Man surprisingly does nothing but spontaneously walk past him, and my fiancé safely gets into my car. 
This guy keeps walking. I pull away and park further into the parking lot, and my fiancé and I talk a little about how scared we both are, not knowing what the hell this guy was doing. A little more terrifying, my car had been giving me trouble on the way there, and so I test drive it around the lot with my fiancé during his break, only proving the problem more urgent. My fiancé was only on a 15 minute break, so I had to call our police department and report this, just asking them to come and check it out since he had two hours left and I was tripping out after Meth Man had seen both our faces. I was one, scared he might follow my love into Walmart with his sword and try something, or two, follow me home, as he saw my car, license plate and both of us drive around the lot during our test drive. After the cops came and tracked my fiancé down in the aisle he was stalking, they got the description and immediately knew who he was. Turns out they knew where he lived, in a trailer park across the street from Walmart, and they actually had been watching out for him because of a previous incident with a security guard at our store. The incident went like this. The security guard stopped him for something. The guy came back a few days later and asked the security guard, what are you still doing in my town? To which the security guard replied, what do you mean? I live here. Not for long, the guy replied. I also feel it's important to mention we live in a small town. It's a tourist attraction town, and the local population is predominantly rich old people, because it's a nice retirement town, but it's very expensive. You will see people strapping AKs to their jeeps, but not meth heads with swords. Anyway, I guess they found him around the parking lot and warned him that if he was seen around Walmart again, let alone carrying anything larger than a 10 inch knife, he was going to be arrested. I haven't seen him since and I'm glad. Guns are scary no doubt, but in our town, a lot of people keep them on their waist so it's not as alarming. However, creepy dude, who's on drugs with a two foot sword, let's not meet. My parents house has an attic. My brother and I were always forbidden from going up there because apparently we were prone to falling down the stairs and hurting our heads. As a child, this is something you'd believe. However, when we moved out, and got lives of our own, our parents started inviting us back home for the holidays. It was around Thanksgiving, and I had come home for a few days to see my parents and catch up, just before Thanksgiving Day. My mother likes to put out the Christmas decorations the day after Thanksgiving. So, she asks me now that I'm older, if I wouldn't mind going up the ladder, into the attic, and helping her get the things she needs from there. I, of course, willingly oblige. I make my way up there and see the box of decorations. I take a moment to take in the attic, a place that for so long I had been not allowed to go into, always seeing it as this dark and sinister place. But it was just an ordinary attic. In the corner, though, something catches my eye. I thought I saw movement. I turned my head, and at that moment I swear I saw a person move into the wall. I just about fall from the stairs and manage to catch myself, my mother running into the room at that moment and asking me if I was okay. I look at her and say I think I saw something in the attic. Then she turns to me with a blank stare on her face and says, and that's why you were never allowed up as children. Still creeps me out to this day, and I have never gone back up to that attic since. This is a story from back when I lived in a small town in Tennessee. The town we lived in was pretty nice, and had a bit of small town charm, and it was about an hour's drive away from Nashville. To give you a scope of how small it was, it had only just gotten a Walmart prior to this incident, 
which was huge seeing as the nearest big grocery store was about a half hour drive away. I was about 14 at the time and was hanging out outside the little hair salon that's so common in big Walmarts while my little brother was getting his hair cut. I was outside of the salon because you weren't allowed to go inside if you had a cart and my dad needed to be inside the store in order to tell them what kind of cut he wanted. This took about half an hour. I amused myself by looking at the weird human species that Walmart seems to attract. After my dad paid for his groceries and we left to go to Home Depot to pick up some things and to Barnes and Nobles to get some books as a reward. I was looking through the young adult section when my dad pulls me aside to tell me that he thinks someone is stalking me because he recognized someone who was wandering around behind us at Walmart. Remember how I said most big grocery stores were a half hour away? Well, this Barnes and Nobles was 45 minutes away from the Walmart. He tells me he's going to confront the guy and that for now I should stay in the sitting area. So seeing as you don't know my dad, I'll give you a rough description of what he looks like. He's six foot two, bald and pretty well cut and hairy. He has a license to conceal and carry weapons in addition to his gun license. So he usually either has a large pocket knife or a gun on him. Most of the time it's pretty easy to overlook this because he wears long sleeves or suits to work and is usually pretty friendly and very easy to get along with and is, more importantly, not a racist skinhead. But if you don't know him and you've done something to seriously piss him off, like stalk his teenage daughter, you can be forgiven for thinking he's a violent skinhead out for your blood. After a few minutes of what I'm guessing is talking to this guy, he comes back to say that it's okay to wander the store. I'm probably lucky that my dad was so observant because I never noticed I was being followed. I am now much more alert and thankfully never saw the creep. A little backstory. I'm a girl and I'm not good with talking to people. And in high school, it was even worse. This is important. Even though I was a sophomore at the time, I had a last free period. My antisocialness was pretty bad. I'd hide out in the library during lunch, unless it was odd days and my friends would catch me and made me socialize. They were mainly my friends, because I used to do their homeworks, but still good people. The first time I met him, it was one such time. They brought me over to their big group, and a guy I didn't recognize was there. Let me tell you, dumbass 15 year old me even got the nope vibes from this guy. The creeper was called Craig. First thing off about him, was his hair. It was long, blonde, and beyond straight, like unnaturally so, almost wig worthy. It was just a weird curtain of golden hair which hung around his pale face. Secondly, his eyes were bright blue and beady. You could feel them looking at you, and they always stayed the same, looking so cold and glassy. Anyhow, I had to sit next to him because it was the only space available. He seemed polite, and I was always taught not to judge a book by its cover. So I tried my best to ease the vibes I got from him, mainly because everyone seemed to think he was such a great guy. What a bunch of morons. After the first lunch, I didn't think much of him. I was dumb and naive and frankly couldn't give a damn that every lunch he happened to sit by me. I decided one day, because there was a breakup in the group, that I was going to sit with the girls consoling my friend, Jessica. We were in the hallway right outside the cafeteria, which sometimes kids ate their food at. It had a stick out on either side, where doors used to be where it was a bomb shelter before it was converted into a school. A lot of kids used to use their phones there to hide from teachers. 
we sat right behind one of the stickouts, and Jessica was sitting in the center with me resting against the stickout doing math homework. The bell had just rang, and I went to pick up my bag, only to turn around and see Craig standing there less than a foot in front of me. He had his blank stare and a small smile on his face. I oddly say hi and pull my bag strap over my shoulder. He doesn't say anything and just stares, and I sigh, just waiting for him to ask where my friends were so that I could nope out of there. Without saying or even blinking, he suddenly steps closer. I step back, swallowing, and look around for any help. Of course, everyone is rushing off to class, so I'm alone with Craig. He doesn't say anything, doesn't blink, and I'm staring up at him. He was a grade older than I was. So, though I was tall for a girl, it really didn't help me out there. I feel his hands skirt about the edge of my shirt, then I jump into flight mode, racing past him quicker than I've run before. From then on, I try not to sit by him, getting to the odd lunches early so I can pick a seat and sat next to my actual friends. He started standing behind my chair, resting his soul patch adorning chin on the top of my head and letting his slender man long arms drag down and touch my hips. Sometimes when lunch would end, he'd squeeze me, hugging me right below my breasts as I died inside. My friends thought it was cute, and that I was blushing because I liked him. I started hanging out with Jessica and the hallway group more often. The wall thing happened again, but this time he had his arm out blocking me, by running by him because I was stuck between him and me. He had curled his fingers through my hair and was murmuring something I couldn't understand. It was a full two minutes of him going from touching my hair to rubbing my hip all the time while I was having a panic attack. Then the late bell rang. I ran and hid in the downstairs bathroom for a good 20 minutes. I should also add that I had been wearing long sleeve baggy clothes and even turtlenecks after the first incident. And I also lived in New Mexico, so I didn't layer. And by now I had told my friends about what Craig was doing, and they had tried to stop us from having contact as much as possible, walking me to class after lunch and blocking him at the lunch tables. I had to even go as far as to report it to the counselor who was basically my best friend. She was pissed about the whole situation and the fact that she couldn't do anything about it because they had the three strikes rule. Craig found a way around this. Like I mentioned before, I had a free period and I tended to hide out in the library. The library was my little sanctuary. I loved and still do love books and I would spend my half hour reading every sci-fi, psychology, or any kind of book that caught my interest that semester. I was in the sci-fi corner, which for one of the reasons I chose it was completely hidden from the librarians and everyone else's view, as I really didn't want to be disturbed. I was halfway through The Time Machine, which is a great book by the way, and all of a sudden I look up, feeling something was off. Lo and behold, Craig had a research period. There he was. Without saying anything, he sets his bag across from me and stands behind my chair. I couldn't breathe at this point. His hand instantly finds literally the only skin that my turtleneck had somehow gotten over. He smells my hair, squeezes my hips, with his nails literally digging into my skin. Craig was mad with me. I thank God I put my bag in the chair next to me, because he had to sit across from me. I don't know how long he was standing there for, but when Craig stopped, I nearly died of happiness. When he did finally sit across from me, leering hatefully, while his icy eyes borrowing themselves into my memory, Craig hunches over the table and leans over to me. 
Can I ask you a question? I'm literally petrified about to piss myself here. So my brain wasn't working well with me. Uh, sure. But for the love of God, don't touch me. He tilts his head, smiling softly, while saying as though asking about the weather. Is your mum a MILF? For the life of me, my innocent ears had no clue what that could possibly be. Uh, I don't know. I don't think so. I had abandoned my beloved books and was nervously begging the bell to ring while covering up my assaulted hips with my turtleneck. He didn't seem deterred by my answer and smiled. Well, what about your sister? Craig chuckled in a low voice. Is she loose? My jaw dropped. Even I knew what that meant. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw this girl, a tall senior, curvy, and staring at Craig with what I can only describe as pure shock. Thank God she was there. No, I managed to whisper, as the girl places back a book and perks up, looking back at us, as though she had just cured cancer, but it had bad side effects. Hey, do you know where I can find... For the love of my life, that girl had no chance in hell to finish her sentence. I grabbed my bag, jumped up, and was by her side in a flash. Yeah, I think it's over here. And I led her to the complete other side of the library, where we didn't go, and instead, she and I walked out the school. The entire time, this unnamed chick held my hand. Once we were out, she hugged me and had me talk to her. I told her everything about what had happened, and the woman told me first thing tomorrow morning I should report it to the counsellor again. I told the counsellor, Mrs. Gates, and she reported it, changing my lunch and telling me to take my free period in the computer room. After two weeks of blissful Craig-free lunches, they were switched back, and it turned out that since Craig failed a year and he was 18, and he had sent some inappropriate pictures as well as lewd messages to freshmen who had reported it to the counsellor, three strikes and probation, and he was kicked out of school and sent to the university. To the guy who pinned me against a wall and ruined my sanctuary, you better hope that we don't meet again. Last night I went to Walmart. And as I walked in, these two guys gave me a strange vibe. It was around 9pm, and the store was busy, so I shrugged it off. I was looking at candy, and one of the two men walked into the aisle, looked at me, and left. Okay, weird. I tried to shrug it off again. But about three minutes later, I was still in the same aisle, and I felt someone behind me. It was dude number two. I got jump scared. I turn around and say, what's up? He replies with a feeble, I uh, thought you worked here. Well, I don't. Why are you standing so close? Get away from me. Oh, um. My bad. I had gym clothes on, but my shirt was a greenish blue, so I thought maybe it was an honest mistake. I continue shopping. I get out of the original aisle I was in, and he's against the wall display of tampons. Just kind of standing. We make eye contact, and he starts looking at the products. Okay, whatever. Maybe he's buying for a friend. I was still spooked, so I did a sharp turn into the next aisle and started walking a little faster. For whatever reason, I stopped at the end, and he slowly approached from the opposite end. Dude, you're creepy, I say to him. What if I just thought you were cute? You don't have to be worried. He's still smug and smiling. That's no way to approach anyone. You scared the hell out of me. That's sometimes a good thing. 
I'm gonna mess you up if you get close to me again. You see, I was scared and really wasn't sure what to say. And I decided my Walmart trip was done. But I was paranoid, so I walked around random aisles for another 15 minutes and only saw him again once. When I finally calmed down, I went to self-checkout and saw him from the corner of my eyes staring at me as I waited in line. He was staring from a distance. Think the customer service and returns to the farthest self-checkout, as most Walmarts look the same in regards to layout. So I kept myself busy in the clearance bins that they kept near the register for some time. I again calmed down and felt like it was safe enough to proceed. I was at self-checkout and I looked up for a second and I see him at the exit, leaning against the wall. This was when I realized none of this was a coincidence and this guy was probably up to something. For a brief second, I thought to myself, I'll just walk to my car and if anything happens, someone will see. I saw him against the wall and something didn't seem right. He was obviously trying to hide. I took a few steps. Then I thought about the girl that got kidnapped at Target. I did a U-turn and told the door greeter. I just said the guys had been following me and I don't know what to do. She turned to see where he was, and again he was standing against the wall trying to hide. He took off running. She told me to walk back to the fitting room and to wait for a manager. I waited 10 minutes and no one ever came. I was annoyed and scared shitless, and ended up calling a friend, and he stayed on the phone with me until I got home. This morning, I called the store to see if they could review the cameras. I spoke to the assistant manager, and she told me that we can assure you nothing happened. I spoke to her manager, and she was a bit more helpful. She said she would review the footage, but nothing could be done without a police report. Fair enough. I'd actually even watch it, to be honest. I called my police department, and the dispatcher asked me some ridiculous questions and asked why I didn't just call 911. I told her I was scared and not thinking straight. She didn't really care what I had to say, and I could tell she probably thought I was being overdramatic. I had a rough night, and just wanted to tell you guys. I'm usually a resilient person, and don't really have anyone in real life to talk to about this. When I was in high school, the house we lived in generally had odd things happen to it. Our cat would freak out and stare at the cabinet as my mum had porcelain dolls and the dolls' heads would frequently be facing different directions than where they were placed. The pull chain on the ceiling fan would click and strange things like that would happen. My room in particular was right next to the attic stairs they ascended over my closet, and I would quite often hear what sounded like scratching behind the wall where the stairwell was, and footsteps right above my room in the attic. Easy small animals getting in the attic, right? We found a small child's bed hidden away in the corner of the attic. When we asked the neighbours, we found that the old owners had a small child that passed away. One night, I was home alone and was about 16 at the time, and I heard what sounded like a closed door bouncing against the doorframe. I went upstairs, because the only possible closed door would be the attic. Sure enough, it was bouncing back and forth against the frame, but that wasn't it. The door handle was jiggling and turning back and forth as the door bounced. I did the only logical thing at that point, shoved the ironing board against the door and sprinted down the stairs, out the back door and went to my neighbor's house until my mum came home. I've encountered my fair share of creepers in my 26 years. I've also had a string of encounters at work that I like to call adventures in waitressing. Maybe I'll share those another time. The following, however, 
was probably the most dangerous situation I've ever been in. After working one night, a friend and I decided to run to the Walmart up the street together to grab a few things. This was a 24-hour Walmart, in a not-so-great area, and not the kind of place that any young woman wants to go to alone at night. I was 20 at the time, and my friend was 19. Both of us are female, and we take separate vehicles and park a fair distance from the entrance, so that we are able to park next to one another. Even though it was about 10.30 at night, the place was pretty busy, and we were definitely further from the entrance than we wanted to be, but we managed to park near a light. We were pretty satisfied with our spots, and headed inside. After about 15 to 20 minutes, we have all of our things, have managed to check out in a timely manner, record speed for Walmart as far as I'm concerned, and are on our way. As we are approaching our cars, we immediately notice a shady little hoopty of a car parked two spots down from mine, sitting in the open, with two men leaning against the passenger side. We continue as if nothing is wrong, smiling and chatting to one another. But our chatter has turned to, you see those guys? Yeah. Okay, we're gonna leave as quick as possible. I've got your back. We say goodbye, but unfortunately, I have to walk around to my driver's side directly in front of them. As I make my way around the back of my car, keys in hand, they both push themselves away from the car, and one starts making his way towards me. He yells out, Hey baby, what's your name? I ignore him, and try to stick my key in the door. I miss. I take a breath and try again, but I continue to struggle with the lock. Meanwhile, this man is rambling on about how beautiful we are, and he pretends that his friend wants to take us to a party. If we would get into their car, they would take us to the party and hook us up. You know, because we're so fine and all. I'm starting to panic a little and he's getting closer and continually asking my name more and more aggressively. I finally get my door unlocked and open, and in frustrated stupidity, I tell him that my name is Megan, and that I'm leaving. I jump in the driver's seat and slam and lock the door. As I'm sticking my key into the ignition, this guy actually leans on my car and continues to harass me about this party through my cracked window. Now, in the summertime where I'm from, it gets incredibly hot, even at night, and it's common practice to leave windows cracked for comfort. It's then that I realize it's still 90 some degrees out, and this dude is wearing a long coat. The alarm bells are screaming in my head, but this dude is plastered on my car, and I'm not thinking straight. I ask him through the window crack to please step away from my vehicle. He continues to try and ask me questions, and tells me that my fine friend and I really need to get into their car. I have mace in my hand, but my window is a manual, and if I tried to spray through the crack, I would end up getting more on myself than I would on him. I ask him nicely one more time to back off, and when he does not comply, I finally yell out that he needs to get the hell off my car because I'm leaving with or without him on it, and that I will run his sorry ass over. As I throw my car into drive, he yells, the hell you say to me? I'm gonna shoot you, and reaches into his long coat. My friend who's been sitting in her car next to me, trying to figure out what to do while this whole exchange takes place, guns it through the parking lot and I follow after her. We drive across the lot without looking back, until we find one of those security vehicles. We stop, and my friend jumps out and runs to his open window, and tells him of what just happened. He starts driving over to them, but they jump in their crappy car and take off. We left Walmart, and drove to the parking lot of a McDonald's to talk, and make sure that we were both okay. We talked about the incident, 
and came to the conclusion that they had probably chosen to wait by our cars, considering we each had distinctly feminine indicators on them. We were sufficiently freaked out, and very glad we made it out of that situation unharmed. I don't think either of us have gone to Walmart after dark ever since. When I was a lot younger, around my early teens, I had a pen pal who I would exchange emails with. Her name was Natsume, and she lived in Japan. I found out she would be visiting America around summer vacation as part of a club activity, or something along those lines. My mother worked for a travel company at the time, and was able to get a little miniature trip pulled together for us to go to Boston, where Natsume would be staying. I was excited about meeting my pen pal in person. It's something I looked forward to greatly. I spent the better part of two months wondering what she would be like in person, if she spoke good enough English for us to understand each other. Well, it turned out to be all for nothing. After several days in Boston, we were unable to get together, except for a very brief moment the night before I was going home. She'd been on tours and all of that sort of stuff with her club, so we didn't get a chance to meet up due to all these structured activities. My mother, as you can imagine, was not pleased. That trip was not terribly expensive, but it wasn't like we were traveling for free. We went to where Natsume was staying and had the trip advisor bring her down. And my mum went off on her. I can definitely understand her reasoning. Meeting her was the entire point of this trip. So long story short, that was the end of my pen pal correspondence with Miss Natsumi. Now, here's where things get kind of strange. On the same night, I went for a little stroll outside the hotel. There was a Wendy's I could see was open from the hotel room. My mum was asleep, and I had five bucks burning a hole in my pocket. Plus, my little delinquent ass wanted to smoke outside where it was nice and cool. As I stepped out through one of the fire doors of the hotel, I lit up a cigarette, and a guy in his late twenties approached me. He asked what I was doing. I said I was going to the Wendy's, and his response was, I'm pretty sure your mother told you not to walk over there without her. Which she had. I didn't really piece together the weirdness of that until later, so I just lied and said she gave me the okay. I started walking as he walked alongside me, puffing on a cigarette of his own. He asked me if I ever got to see my pen pal, and I told him that I hadn't. Sorry, kid, he told me. But if she came here with people from her school, there was no way they'd let you run around Boston with you and your mum. She should have known better. I quickly realized that this man I'd never met before and knew things about me that there was no way he could have known. For starters, this was back when there was no Wi-Fi everywhere. You literally had to plug your internet in in the wall of the hotel. So it's not like I'd been on the internet announcing my plans and crap. We didn't even own a laptop. Hell, we didn't even use the hotel phone the entire time we were there. Who the hell is this guy? And how does he know so much about me? Asking seemed like a really bad idea, so I didn't. He walked me all the way over to the Wendy's. Hurry up and get your food, kid, he told me. I won't tell if you won't. Just make it quick, it's late. Well, I got my food, and the creepy man stood outside the restaurant while I ate. Then when I got out, he escorted me back to the hotel. We talked a little about video games as we walked, Sonic Adventure 2 specifically, because I'd been playing religiously before coming on this trip. We both parted ways, and the man told me, if your mum asks, just lie, and say you were in the exercise room, and throw your cup out before you go upstairs. I had been dicking around in the exercise room every night at the hotel. I liked playing on the treadmill and pumping iron. This person, who I'd never met before, who I never saw again, knew so much about me. 
that he could pass for my older brother. I still wonder what it was about to this day, and this seemed like a good place as any to tell this story. It was a strange trip. A couple of years ago, I worked at this 24 hour diner. Sometimes I worked the night shift. One day I was at Walmart after an afternoon shift in my quite painfully recognizable uniform. The guy in front of me had these crazy eyes. This guy in front of me was taking his sweet time bagging up his groceries and he said hi. So I just said hi back. He was like, Oh, you work at the diner? Yup, I replied, and he left the store. I bagged my groceries and walked out, and a few minutes later, the guy was outside and saw me get into my car. He didn't follow me, or so I thought, and that was that. Fast forward two weeks, I'm working the night shift and it's 2am. I was sitting outside smoking a cigarette and talking on the phone and this white van pulls up, and guess who hops out? He was like, hey girl, I've been looking for you, remember me? His eyes were bugging out of his head, and he had a few buddies in his van. I stuck my phone in my pocket. He grabbed my wrist and began pulling me into the van saying, come hang out with us. And I was just like, dude, no, yanked away and began backing towards the door. He kept asking if I could at least give him my number. I just ran inside and told my almost seven foot tall co-worker. Two nights later, one of the windows was shot in with a BB gun during the night shift that luckily I wasn't working. But my co-workers told me a bunch of dudes who drove a white van were the culprits. This incident happened a few years ago. It was around 9 p.m. Me, my mum, and my sister were getting ready for bed. It was around the middle of summer, so it was a hot night. My sister was sleeping in the living room because her room was too hot to sleep in, which was normal for us to do. We all say our good nights and head for bed. Five minutes later, my mother wakes me in a panic with my sister clutching to her side. My mum tells me to get a bat and search the house for any intruders. So I did. I found nothing, doing a very thorough search, and I come back into the living room and ask what happened. My sister kept hearing a voice that said in a very threatening way, there is no escape. Keep in mind our family are hard believers in the paranormal. We also are Wiccan and we have a protective barrier around our house, so there's no way an evil spirit could have gotten in. The next day we went out and brought sage and other herbs to cleanse our house, and since then, we've never had another experience. To this day, I'm still afraid of our house. The only spirits left in the house is an old man that lives in the attic, though he's a friendly spirit, so I doubt it would have been him. My only other explanation is that an evil spirit threw its voice through the barrier and into the living room. But that wouldn't explain how we haven't had any other problems. This is the story of my mum's stalker. She kept getting weird poems and letters stuck into our mailbox. Creepy romantic, often pretty obscene, talking about forbidden love and secret admirers. She had no idea where they were coming from. No one in the neighborhood was weird and everyone was like my family. And she was happily married and couldn't think of anyone she knew who could be into her. My dad wasn't worried. He trusted her and they had a fantastic marriage and being the type of guy he was, always told her he'd take care of it. If anyone were to man up past sending letters and threaten her on their marriage. One day, she got another letter with a line reading something like, I want what I see between the lines. She had no idea what it meant and pondered it for a bit until she connected the dots from the other letters. 
The lines were the horizontal blinds we had in the kitchen, where she often was. Her stalker, our neighbour, that was a husband and a father, was peeking at her through the blind for months. Upon finding out, my father grabbed a metal bat, smashed the hell out of his mailbox, and nearly kicked down the guy's door and had a word with him. They moved shortly after, and that may or may not have been completely by choice. I used to work at one of those 24-7 Walmart supercenters. I was right out of high school, a 19-year-old female, and worked as a cashier for two terrible years, where I was subjected to all kinds of abuse from customers and co-workers alike. I mean, I was screamed at, slammed into a register face first, groped, and even farted on once because this old lady was mad that oranges were priced each and not by the pound. However, the time that sticks out in my head the most is the time a customer tried to follow me home. I had just started my shift, and the second I got onto the register, I had a line of about 10 people long. For some reason, the Walmart I worked at never had enough registers open, so people were usually really angry and impatient by the time they got to me. I get right to work, and keep a smile plastered on my face while making the minimal mandatory small talk. Hi, how are you? Did you find everything? Most customers were polite, but not very interested in talking, so it's easy to fall into a bit of a cashier robot mode. I get this guy, who only has two items, yogurt and band-aids. I ring it all up in record time and neatly bag it up, but the customer doesn't seem to be paying attention. He wouldn't look at me or answer my greetings. His eyes just stared right down at the conveyor belt. Maybe he was a bit zoned out. The conveyor belt didn't look too dirty. I hadn't had a chance to wash it yet because the second I walked over to the register, people lined up. Side note, always bag up your produce. Conveyor belts get really nasty. I told the man his total, which was something like 436, and he starts fishing in his pockets for exact change without looking up. Inwardly, I groan, but keep my customer service smile fixed in place while I wait. He is wearing one of those muddy brown denim jackets, with lots of pockets. As he rifles through, I keep catching whiffs of stale B.O. and cigarettes. His hands were pretty dirty too, and all dried out from the cold weather. He dumps out an assortment of change on the counter, still not looking at me, and I begin to count it up. Everything is uncomfortably quiet. I can feel the eyes of every customer waiting in line, boring into me. All except the guy, who was then digging in his pants pocket too. He was about 30 cents short. I let him know once I was sure he wasn't going to find any more coins. It was then that he looked at me, making this scrunched up face. His eyes were very dark brown, almost black and they pierced right into me, accusingly, as if he thought I was lying or something. While he was watching, I counted everything again. It's only 30 cents. Can't you just give me your employee discount? No, that's against the rules, I answered apologetically. Wanna put something back? I wasn't about to get fired for giving someone my discount which was only 10% if you're wondering. He wasn't the first person to ask for it, but most people pretended they were joking, whereas he was not. No, I want them, he said, glaring at me. I was beginning to wish he'd start staring at the conveyor belt again instead of me. He was making me pretty uncomfortable. If I'd had 30 cents in my pocket, I would have paid it myself just to get this guy to leave. He reaches over to take the bag, but I turn the little bag carousel so that he can't. 
That was probably a stupid move on my part. But it wasn't like I could let him steal, right? If my register was short 30 cents, my supervisors would be all over me. I know you get a discount. Just plug it in. He completely blows up at this point. But I just shake my head and look at the other customers, probably with a deer in headlights expression. People are watching, but no one does anything. This is just something that's inconveniencing them. Even though I'm actually pretty scared, I'd already started flashing my register lights so that the CSM would come, but they were notorious for taking their sweet time. I'll get a CSM, but it might take a few minutes, I nervously offer. The man just goes off and goes on about how it's not that much and he needs it, with some explicit language thrown in, of course. He leaves before the supervisor comes over, grabbing all of his change and shoving it all into his pocket before stomping off. I was relieved that he was gone and continue working in uneasy silence. Everything seemed to go on as normal after that. My shift ends at midnight and I managed to clock out on time for once. I didn't have a car and would normally call my mum to pick me up but she was out of town and it was too late to call anyone else. So I decided to walk rather than waste money on a cab. I only lived about 20 minutes away and I felt pretty safe walking because you didn't tend to run into other pedestrians at that hour. After a few minutes of walking, I noticed a car that was driving by really slowly behind me. The speed limit was 45 and this car was going at about 10. I got a bad gut feeling and walked a little faster while trying to rationalize it. It could have been someone who wanted to offer me a ride or get directions, but no. Whoever it was stayed behind me and did not try to pull up next to me at all, even though they were going really slowly. After about five minutes of this, the car finally turns off into one of the neighborhoods. I was relieved, but this was short-lived. The driver parks his car on the curb and gets out of the car. Then comes jogging up to me. I realize immediately that it was Yogurt Band-Aid Guy and he was wearing the exact same muddy brown jacket and was staring at me with those dark eyes. I turn around to begin jogging down the sidewalk, which is still icy, and he just jogs up first next to me. I can actually hear the change jingling in his pockets. He doesn't say anything at first, so I try to run faster without slipping. Had this guy been sitting in the parking lot for hours, waiting for me to get off work? Apparently so. I feel him staring at me and turn my head to look at him while still running as fast as I can on the ice, inwardly thanking my lucky stars that there was fresh gravel laid out, or I probably would have slipped in classic horror movie cliche. What color is your underwear? He asks. This question both horrified and disgusted me, so my immediate reaction was, don't be a creep, and I punched him right in the face, it hurt my hand like a bitch, but he stops running for a second and bends forward a bit clutching his face. I swear I heard him say okay, but I just kept running and I was too scared to look back. I'm not sure if he kept following me after that, but I didn't run straight home because I was scared that he would figure out where I lived. When I did make it home, about an hour later, I went to my landlady's apartment first and told her what happened. I was really shaken up and I told her that if she saw a suspicious guy around the building, she should call the police. My mum was out of town. I did still live with her at the time and she didn't answer my calls. So I watched Disney movies until I calmed down enough so that I could fall asleep. The next day, I told my managers at work what happened but they didn't care. In hindsight, I probably should have called the police, but I was young 
and thought that, if it were necessary, management would have told me to do it. Don't know why I thought that, considering they had a way of not really caring about their employees, and this sort of situation wouldn't have made them look good. This wasn't the only Walmart-related instance where police should have been called, but weren't. I felt pretty angry that they didn't take me seriously, or care that I was scared. I wanted to go home early because I was scared that the guy would show up again, but they told me no, and made me go to work at the registers. I quit shortly after that. I never did see Yogurt Band-Aid guy again, and it's been about 10 years. I'm not even sure I'd recognize him if I did. So, Yogurt Band-Aid guy, let's not meet again. I had to go grocery shopping tonight for some essentials to cook supper. I'm rushed out to the local Walmart to get everything I needed. I was sitting in the parking lot in my truck texting my boyfriend to see what else I needed to pick up, and watched a few people pull in further down in the lot. I'm very aware of my surroundings, and I see an older man park about halfway down from where I am, and walk into the store. I get out of my truck, and go to start my shopping. As I'm going through the aisles and grabbing my things, I see the creepy man several times, and I just assume that he's shopping for similar things that I am, and trying to get my shopping done and over with. Eventually, I get to the till, and he is at the same one. He stares at me and starts grinning, and will not stop looking at me or paying attention to me. Even when he has to pay or grab his bags. At this point, I'm quite uncomfortable. I chat with the cashier for a while, hoping he'll leave and be gone if I take my time. And eventually, I go back and head to my truck. I get outside, and luckily, I'm in a parking stall close to the entrance that's easily accessible. And I see him in his truck right next to mine, now watching the entrance. I get into my car with my groceries all at once, lock my doors ASAP, and drive away as fast as I can. I'm basically bricking it at this point. I took the busiest streets I could in order to get home, and luckily he didn't follow me, or tried and got lost. I really hope to not encounter him again. Our story takes place not long ago, on Monday of this week. I was at a Costco in the US with my mum, and we had decided that after we had picked up our groceries, that we'd grab a bite to eat from the Costco pizza place. My mum leaves to go to the bathroom, so I'm left all alone standing in the back of the pizza place. Now here's where things turn for the creepy. An older man in his 50s to 60s calmly approaches me, and in a sweet tone goes, Hey kid, want a free drink? And offers me an empty cup. Now knowing that I was about to get in line to order some food and beverages, I politely decline his offer. And then his tone changed. He spoke in a lower, more gravelly voice. Kid, don't be dumb. It's a free drink. It's at this point I decide to inspect the cup he's holding, and notice a shine around the edges of the cup. The rest of the cup was completely dry and untouched. This seemed awfully suspicious. I again decline his offer, making him visibly upset as he begins to approach me. Thank God for my mum. She comes back in the nick of time and the old man backs away, and leaves the area altogether. I never saw him after that, and I don't want to think about what he put in the cup, or why he wanted to offer it to a fairly small girl. <laughs> 